start recording okay so it's a great pleasure to have uh, professor uh, fernando quevedo from uh, department of applied mathematics and theoretical physics university of cambridge and he is also uh, the former director of ictp and he works on particularly the string cosmology area and he is going to give an a uh, broad overview of this subject uh, the title of his talk is string theory cosmology before during and after inflation and this is basically the 19th qastm talk and we are uh, from the qastm family we we are thankful to fernando for giving his time and for this talk fernando you can start thank you very much thank you sayanta for the invitation and it's a pleasure to 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 be here and, and uh, to give this talk. Unfortunately, I, I of course I had to do it on uh, by Zoom rather than personally. And uh, I hope that everybody who's listening is in is safe and taking care of uh, all yourselves in, in these difficult uh, times. And uh, <clears throat> okay, so I will talk about some uh, work that I've been doing over the years with some, many collaborations. And uh, and uh, so I titled "String Theory: Cosmology Before, During, and After Inflation." Um, <clears throat> so this is the outline. Is uh, since I've heard some mixed audience, a lot of uh, some some students will be uh, master students and so on. So I will try to start from the some basics, but we'll then move on towards um, the, the 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 more uh, the some research. But based is mostly like a science and say like a like a lecture rather than a last uh, paper talk. Um, so, so you can see the, the, I hope you can follow my mouse, yes. The, <clears throat> first I will give a very quick overview of inflation just to, 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 to fix the, the, the main points. Then uh, um, the string compactifications, the string landscape and swamland before inflation, uh, talking about the vacuum transitions, and then models of string inflation, and then post-inflation. So, and as I said in, in the, at the bottom of the slide, I have um, mostly will be an overview, with the exception of two points that I will try to emphasize, is this vacuum the case, which is in the section before inflation, uh, which I will talk about uh, the work that I have been doing in the last, uh, a year or so with uh, Chantal de Alves, uh, Francesco Muria, uh, Veronica Pasquarella, and uh, and then and also with um, with Sebastian Cespedes, uh, paper to appear. Uh, <clears throat> and then the other point that I would like to emphasize at the end is something that uh, that we have been very keen in, uh, considering now is the issue about high frequency gravitational waves. So that is high frequency means very high compared to what the, uh, Lisa and LIGO and so on uh, are planning. And uh, this is uh, something I, will, I think is very interesting for a string and for cosmology in general. And uh, <clears throat> so I will try to emphasize at the very end. So these are the two things that I will emphasize, but most of the talk will be a review. Okay, so let me start. Okay, so we have, what people usually say, we have two standard models. One is the standard model of particle physics, for which we have plenty of uh, understanding now. We have all the particles and fields and interactions and so on, very well under control. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> it has been a triumph, say, of what uh, is gauge field theories and effective field theories. Uh, and I wanted to emphasize the, the standard thing of the, the Higgs Field is uh, first of all that it was discovered uh, not only eight years ago or so, but uh, it, it's a it's a good uh, thing to remind us that uh, some kind of theoretical speculations over many years then become real experimental uh, successes after many years. And in the case of the Higgs, it's very important because the first particle that we have uh, that's a first elementary particle, which is a scalar field. And most of what I will be talking today is, uh, is about potential for scalar fields. And so we can see <clears throat> there's a prime example, which is the Higgs, the Higgs field. And uh, 
The other point I wanted to emphasize is that the effective field theories have been on the, on the basis of all this big success of the standard model. And, uh, <clears throat> and, um, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and essentially uh, it's because of that that we understand the standard model in terms of uh, different scales. And uh, for instance, we can talk about the uh, chiral perturbation theory. The standard model itself can be an effective field theory once we introduce gravity. And, uh, and then, then effective field theory is behind the whole understanding of nature we have so far. Uh, <clears throat> and the other point uh, that I think is good to always remember is that uh, nature has been very kind to us somehow because uh, essentially all the couplings that we have seen, the couplings, the electromagnetic coupling and, 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 uh, and um, the couplings within the Higgs potential and so on are weak. And if they're not weak, that they are asymptotically free, which is like, like a color, and then that allows us to do calculations in an expansion. So in that sense, um, we have been lucky to to have that uh, that tool in our. Uh, uh, I have a question, Fernando. Yes, please. Uh, so in the least, why the graviton spin is zero? Oh, I'm sorry, it's it's a mistake. <laughs> it's a, it's, a, it's a typo. It's a spin oh, tool. Okay. Yes, sorry, sorry about that. Yes, <laughs> thank you for catching it. Yes, yes, and you had a star because it's not it's not there. Yes, I, I, now that you mentioned, it's good to, to say that uh, I have been just lecturing the standard model course this this year, and um, and and just classifying the particles by spin and and and, and helicities and, and and mass if they have a mass. It's, it's, uh, it goes all the way from just from this, the, the special relativity in quantum mechanics brings you that, and from that you can get the standard model. So at the end, it was con it's something like unavoidable that uh, uh, that we have what we have essentially that that, that the standard model described by uh, Young Mills theory or by uh, in, uh, traumatic interactions and so on is 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 kind of unavoidable, even though the history was very complicated, and the classification in terms of uh, spin and helicities is the key. And uh, of course, there's a particular model and there are many other, other models. I have another question. Yes? It is, uh, you, uh, you have mentioned about effective field theories. Yes. So like uh, in which scale you are uh, thinking about to construct the effective field theory? Because in each effective field theory, there has to be some cutoff. Uh, okay. So like, uh, which is the cutoff of this theory? Like the Planck scale or the below? Very good. That's a very good question. But that's the other thing that is kind of surprising or, or interesting is that when I was a student or so, people were very keen to say that, well, the standard model is a renormalizable theory, and then we have a, um, a good control on the theory. So it's a very good thing to be renormalizable. And the famous the tooth proof that uh, uh, the young Mills theories with broken symmetries were renormalizable was a big success. And now, I think with the vision with effective field theories, I don't know if that's good news. So at the end, uh, we, we know the fact that the standard model has to be an effective field theory because gravity is there. Yeah. And if gravity is there, the, 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 the cutoff will be natural at the Planck scale, as you say. Um, however, uh, imagine that the standard model were not renormalizable, so then you could have a hope that the cutoff will be lower and there will be more, much more interesting uh, uh, motivation for experimental uh, tests beyond the standard model. So okay. now we can have the worst case scenario that there may be no more fundamental physics until the Planck scale, which is. But is the below a, means, uh, is there is any number? Sorry? So below, I can understand, which is below the Planck scale. Yes. But, uh, in which, when it, like, there are a lot of energy scales people used to probe, like electroweak scale supergravity 10 to the power 16 watt scale or something like that. So mm -hmm. like, uh, uh, to probe it in LHC, I think uh, the scale has to be very low. Uh, right, exactly, exactly. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, the LHC is, is, is probing just a TV scale, which is uh, 15 yeah. orders of magnitude below the Planck scale. Uh, so, but uh, formally, I mean, the, there is nothing that, <clears throat> Tells us that the effective field, the standard model can be effective field theory all the way to the plan scale. There are indications like the, the hierarchy problem that has been driving our research for many years because we saw, well, of course, there is a problem. Personally, now we saw the Higgs, and the Higgs is, uh, uh, is providing masses to other particles and so on. That we say, but the Higgs also provides 
a concrete uh, problem, which is why the mass of the Higgs is that small, because uh, if, the, if you have a cutoff, then uh, um, loops of quantum particles will give you contributions to the to the to to the mass of the Higgs that will bring it out as high as the cutoff. So if the cutoff is very very large, the the, the natural uh, value of the Higgs mass will be as large as the cutoff, and it happens to be small. So uh, and so that uh, we were expecting something to come up, saying LAC, maybe a silk will come up, which we haven't seen yet. Uh, that that will show why uh, um, uh, illustrate why the mass of the Higgs is uh, small, and uh, of course that we had a big hole in supersymmetry, and uh, still it may be. I, I will say some words at, uh, at some point about the supersymmetry, but at the moment uh, the hierarchical problem is, is just a, a tuning problem, but not a, it's not a fundamental problem. Whereas quantum gravity, of course, of course, is a yeah. real issue, and then the, there's a, the only case that we can say that where the standard model will definitely uh, will fail, say, will be at the Planck scale, and so. On. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. Good. Very good. Okay. Thank you for the questions. Okay. Um, so, and then the second standard model is uh, cosmology, and so people talk about now the, the the standard model of cosmology, which is lambda CDM. As a, and uh, lambda means a cosmological constant, and CDM means cold dark matter. Um, plus inflation, in the sense that we need some, some source of what the cosmic microwave background is giving us as a almost a scale invariant Gaussian adiabatic density with perturbations. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, this, um, this plot that uh, maybe uh, I'm sure you all have seen, uh, uh, before, this is an uh, incredible thing to see as a success story about uh, cosmology and, and especially, in particular, the la latest uh, Planck results that uh, that fits very, 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 very well with the theory, and <clears throat> and that that uh, gives you a picture that we have about the history of the universe very well uh, with the, this period of inflation. This is not universally accepted, but mostly accepted. To, to be the, the, the beginning of the, I mean, the early universe and the, and the source of these uh, density perturbations. Uh, however, I have to emphasize that contrary to the standard model of particle physics, this one is not a theory itself. It's, it's just uh, in, uh, an ad hoc uh, model in the same that it doesn't, doesn't explain what is the origin of lambda, the, the cosmological constant, and doesn't explain what cold dark matter is, what is the particle which is the dark matter. And it still doesn't have a theory for inflation. So, so, <clears throat> so inflation is just a, a, a ad hoc potential that is added to the to the theory. So, in that sense, uh, that already illustrates uh, open questions for this uh, for this um, uh, successful cosmological scenario. Uh, <clears throat> that is something we have to to explore, and that's one of the motivations for the string cosmology. So, in this one slide, I think I will try to summarize the. The basis of inflation. Um, <clears throat> first is this, the start with the point is the Friedman Lemaitre Robertson Walker uh, metric. We start with the standard um, uh, metric for a, a homogeneous and isotropic universe. Uh, I decided to include K, which is the measure of the curvature. K can be zero, plus or minus one for a flat, closed, or open universe. And uh, <clears throat> So that, that will give us a, a, a different a special, a special, a special um, a structure of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of the geometry of space-time being, of course, a closer spherical, symmetric, uh, flat, or, or hyperbolic type of, of the open universe. <clears throat> and from my sense equations, we had uh, the Hubble parameter, a, a dot over a square, has satisfied this equation. But again, the curvature appears here, and the Newton's constant is related to the Planck scale in this way. And the acceleration is given by this expression. But now I'm uh, assuming that we have gravity coupled to a scalar field phi. And so this is, uh, this is the energy density in general, and I put the energy density due to the, to the scalar field. The same thing here, this is the acceleration in terms of the kinetic and potential energies of the scalar field. <clears throat> and uh, um, sorry, my mouse sometimes disappears, so I hope that uh, it's okay. Um, 
and of course you can see that if the potential energy dominates over the kinetic energy, the acceleration, so you have a positive acceleration, then you have this period of inflation and it's reflected by, by the potential uh, shape which you see here at this stage of almost constant potential so that the, the potential energy dominates over the kinetic energy and that gives an acceleration and that gives rise to, to this period of inflation. And that is uh, measured in terms of these two parameters, epsilon and eta, there's the, uh, the derivative of the potentials, divided by the potential square, and the second derivative divided by the potential. The, if they are both small, the, then <clears throat> using the equation for the scalar field, you can see this, the field rolls slowly, and while it rolls, then the energy is dominated by the potential energy, and then you have acceleration. <clears throat> also, when you have that case, the, the since it accelerates, the, the, uh, the scale factor increases a lot. And by increasing a lot, the, the, this term becomes less and less important. And that's a way of uh, saying that wow, inflation solves the, the <clears throat> problems of the, of the Big Bang, in particular, why we see that the universe is almost flat now. So the flatness problem. And so that means that independent of the value of k, at this time will be negligible once the universe starts uh, accelerating. And it addresses the other problems like, <clears throat> like the horizon problem and so on. Uh, and but on top of that, it's, it gives you a concrete way of computing the density perturbations, the fluctuations of the scalar field and the metric uh, uh, during inflation. And, uh, and that is almost a scale invariant, but determined by this ns minus one, when ns is almost one, but not one. And it differs from one by these coefficients, uh, which terms proportional to the parameters epsilon and eta. And very importantly, there is this also uh, uh, gravitational waves coming from 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 uh, from this perturbation. So that means perturbations of the metric itself. That the, uh, <clears throat> and and the ratio of the the tensor to scalar ratio is proportional to this parameter epsilon also. And that's very important to, because it has not it has not been detected, and this could be one of the predictions that could be put to test in the future. So I had one question in the previous slide. Yes. Yeah. So in this density perturbation, this k is the mode you are talking about. And this k is not actually the special curvature k. Uh, like, yes. Uh, this no, no, k, k is the special curvature. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. There are two k's. Just unfortunately, there, there are a uh, very good point. Yes, k here is, the, is k is equal to 0 plus or minus 1. No, I, have asked is, this, is, is, I know is, this, no. but I have asked because of the audiences. A lot of people don't. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, it's a good point. Yes. <laughs> yes, it's unfortunate there are a finite number of letters, and sometimes we use them a lot. Uh, H, for instance, is very much used for many things. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. And then, um, well, these are the Planck bounds on this NS against R. This is R against NS. And, and then, uh, you can see is is a uh, this is the preferred values and then this is a different combination of different with different experiment, uh, other experiments, but essentially, NS is of the order of 0.96 and R is very small, it's smaller, much smaller than 0.05. So, so in that sense, uh, hopefully in the future we will explore these regions here, and uh, yes. Okay. So. Um, but there are many open questions for inflation, of course. Uh, what is the origin and nature of inflation? What is the origin of this particular potential energy? Uh, is, if it is uh, almost flat, why is it like that, a potential like that? Who is the inflaton, for instance? Uh, reheating, what happened at, at, at the end? So um, let me just go back to the potential here. So at the end of inflation, the, the field continues rolling, say. Now, fast, uh, uh, fast, so the inflation finishes because then kinetic energy becomes important. But the important thing is that when fields relaxes to its minimum, that's supposed to be what people used to call before the Big Bang. This is supposed to be the, 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 the creation of all the other, uh, uh, particles of the standard model and you know, by the coupling to the dilaton and so. And then that would be what that's called, that is what is called reheating. And uh, so, Fernando, yeah? I have one more uh, doubt. Mean uh, like uh, the so I can understand like uh, it's kind of a generic structure of the potential you were talking about where 
people has to slowly roll down and comes to the valley and uh, comes to the minimum and then start oscillating and then generate the heat yes. uh, during the heating procedure. But like in string theory, we have different different types of potential which is not exactly same. You might have a little bit different structures. Absolutely, absolutely. And you can have many fields and they, some of them will be the inflaton and something else will be the, the, the yeah. heating. And I will come to that. Uh, I, I will discuss that in detail. Yes. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> absolutely. Okay. So, but then it's an issue about, about reheating. You have to, to remember that the, you cannot just separate and consider about the cosmology itself uh, or the inflaton itself. But at the end, you need to see how it couples to, to real matter, to the quarks and leptons that I show in my first slide and then how uh, they can be uh, uh, produced by reheating. Yeah, true. And, okay. and then the initial condition, why do you start at that point uh, in the potential and, and, and rolling? So that, that's, that's, a, that's an issue. <clears throat> so there are many questions. And then for that, you say, well, maybe strings. So this is strings theory is supposed to be the, the main candidate to be the unified, um, theory of all matter and interactions. So it has to tell you something about cosmology in particular. <clears throat> you may see if you can get inflation or not or some from string theory. Of course, uh, addressing the Big Bang itself, the initial singularity, uh, <clears throat> you are still a bit far from, from, from doing it. Locally, again, nature has been, or nature, uh, the, the, force, the source of inflation, is, is, uh, is very interesting because it can be addressed by just using effective field theories. So, and since I emphasized before, effective field theories have been so successful in the past. Uh, so we can extract information from infective field theories coming from a string theory and address issues about inflation. Ideally, we'll be also be open-minded to consider not only inflation, but also any alternative of inflation that gives rise to, that can give rise to, to to the density perturbations and solving the same problem that inflation solved. And of course, string theory sh is, should be rich enough to consider the couplings of the inflaton field to matter and then study the issue about reheating, dark matter, biogenesis, and dark energy, and so on. So, in principle, that, that's, that's a uh, motivation to study uh, these issues with string theory. And uh, so, let me go quickly through this slide just to remind you again that a string theory is a theory of, of everything or nothing, essentially, of all the particles, or, or it doesn't work. So, that's why it is so complicated to come up with some concrete, realistic model of, of a string theory, because you have to, to get the cosmology right, but you have to also get the particle physics right. So, you have to get uh, the gauge and matter structure of the standard model with the three families and quarks and leptons that I mentioned in the first slide. You have to get the hierarchy of scales and masses including neutrino masses, which are very light. You have to get uh, the CKN metrics, you know, the kabibo kabayashi Mastava metrics, the PMNS for, 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 for the lepton sector, the mixing, CPU, relations, no flavor change, neutral coherence, all those things. Uh, and the hierarchy of gauge couplings, the electroweak and strong couplings, and hopefully with some unification. You have to get a quasi-stable proton, but still have a, a source to have a matter antimatter and symmetry to get biogenesis. And as I say, get inflation or alternatives to get the, the fluctuations in the economic microwave background, get dark matter, to, and, but also avoid overclosing, not just the dark matter candidate, but that gives you the right uh, contribution to the, to the overall density of the universe. Uh, in principle, you can get dark radiation, but not too much because there is a limit in dark radiation. To the, the effective number of neutrinos is three, which is the number of neutrinos plus a little bit more. So that there's not, not much room to that. So string theory, if it gives you a dark radiation, you have to be very much constrained. And also dark energy, which is essentially... Oh, I have a question. Question, yes, please. Yeah. So uh, like uh, how string theory can be able to explain this point zero four in the ineffective? Uh, no, yes, as, uh, I'm telling you as, as a bound. So usually string theory can give you candidates for dark radiation. Dark radiation means it will be something like a neutrino. Right? It's very, very, very uh, light. That means moving with the speed of, uh, almost to the speed of, like the speed of light, but also dark, I mean, not, not charged on the electromagnetic interactions. And there's a strong bound coming from CMB and others that uh, this uh, NF uh, uh, number, this measure on this number, effective number of neutrinos, uh, and the three is already taken care of by the neutrinos we know. So there's not much room to add to this dark radiation. 
<clears throat> it doesn't mean that it's a 0 0.04 of a particle, <laughs> but it's yeah, a, yeah, it's, yeah, it's like it's very a, confusing. That's why. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, it cannot be so. This dark the contribution of, of dark radiation to uh, uh, an effective is very much constrained by this uh, number. So that means that if you have very uh, several candidates for dark radiation, the theory may be ruled out because uh, it will be against this. So so that that's a, a, a way to constrain the models. And uh, I always emphasize that if one of these conditions doesn't work, then you can rule out the model. And of course, in the past, we used to start very often with, oh, let me, let me get chiral matter, let me get a model that has a three cross two cross two one. Uh, let me see if I can get three families and so on. But then you start yeah. going down the list, and at some point you stop because you cannot get flavor changing recurrence, so you, you don't have a stable proton. But if you start from the bottom up, it's very difficult because you, start, you have to start spending dark energy, which is a big challenge. And I will address some of the things now. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, from string theory, uh, the starting point, uh, of course, I will not give you a lecture on string theory, it will be too much, but just I extract the, the important issues. There are several string theories, five of them. I, I include here 11 dimensional supergravity, which just fits very well with the whole duality scheme about all the string theories. Important thing that they're all in 10 or 11 dimensions. They're all supersymmetric with a many different number of uh, supercharges. And the massless states, which are the relevant for low energy, are very limited. So, for instance, we have here the, the metric, anti symmetric tensor, a scalar. Uh, for the heterotic, we also have um, uh, gauge fields. And, but for the other ones, we don't have the gauge fields. Uh, for instance, type 1, type 2B, less concentrated. If uh, you can see type 2B, I'm sorry that my mouse sometimes disappears. Um, in the type 2B, you see that at the top, uh, at the, on the right, you see GMN, BMN, and phi, which is metric and anti-symmetric tensor, and phi, which is called a dilaton, and C, which is a, a scalar, like an action-like scalar. CMN is a two-index anti-symmetric tensor, and CMNPQ is a four-index anti-symmetric tensor. And that's all you have at at, um, at the zero mass, which is low energies, plus the fermionic partners like a gravitino and so on. So imagine you have to, to come up with the whole nature we see with the quarks and leptons and interactions and so on out of these few states, which is very challenging somehow. Uh, on top of that, you have a tower of uh, string states which are very massive and they, they, they will not appear physically in, in our low energy world. <clears throat> so the first thing we have to do is compactify. And so we have to go from 10 to four dimensions. And then the extra dimensions, so the six dimensions, so for instance, uh, people study them. And in order to preserve uh, one supersymmetry and, and no more and no less, just one supersymmetry, uh, uh, then, uh, then there's a solution for the uh, equations of the string theory. And that's the, the corresponding extra dimension. The six extra dimensions should be a six dimension uh, manifold uh, with it's called vanishing first chain class, which is essentially a Calabi-Yau manifold. <clears throat> and that has, you can, the, uh, it has, it admits a Ricci flat metric, and uh, um, which is not known. And so it's a very complicated manifold in the sense that it doesn't have isometries and we don't know the metric. However, it has a very rich topological structure. And I would like, I, I emphasize it here with these uh, plots. Uh, here with a very uh, rich structure of, of cycles, non-trivial cycles. Uh, like imagine you have a torus, and the torus, you have a, a, a transversal, you have a circle, and the other side you have another circle. So you can see a torus like the, the two cycles, two non-trivial cycles, which are circles. Here, since the manifold is six-dimensional, the non-trivial cycles are higher dimensional, uh, four-dimensional or three-dimensional. So in this case here, you have, like I'm illustrating here, a four-dimensional cycle in the six-dimensional clavilla on which I am wrapping an object which is called a D-brain. And this D-brain exists, it has to exist because it's the object that couples to the anti-symmetric tensors that I was mentioning before. Uh, this this D-brain that was wrapping the cycle is a D7-brain. Four of the dimensions wrap a four cycle. And the other three dimensions are the ones that will be uh, our universe. Uh, on the right here, you uh, you see at the top just one on one point that will be a D three brain, which is three special dimensions. So it has it's not wrapping anything, just at the at the singular point. 
And uh, an example of that I put uh, uh, below, uh, one of them could be our universe. So this is the, the picture that we can see. So <clears throat> it's a complicated Calabellao manifold with many of these non-trivial cycles and brains attached. And that's how you will get um, matter fields and so on, on, the, on, on from, from, from these uh, brains. I have <clears throat> a small question in the structure of Calabellao. Yes, please. So wh what this, uh, like, uh, if you are really interested in like three plus one dimension, then uh, like uh, I can understand that after do the uh, purpose of doing this compactification is to get some kind of lower dimensional three plus one dimensional theory out of a higher dimensional string theory. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. but like uh, what uh, what is the purpose of this uh, like uh, uh, this uh, like it's looking like some kind of starfish. So what are these legs corresponding? Ah. <laughs> well, this is a, 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 some, some illustration. Uh, this is a, actually, I can advertise, this is a, um, an artist uh, drawing from a Scientific American article I wrote with Cliff Borges uh, like 12 years ago. <laughs> and, uh, so essentially, it's, it's a, it's, 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 it's a, a artist representation of what a Calabellao could be. So you can have uh, this uh, starfish, this long things will be like throats, like the Calabria can have. You can think about throats that we also see when we draw uh, black holes and so on. And that the being uh, elongated, that means that there's some warping there. And that plays an important role because then the scale, if, if so it is, is very this elongated. Called, is this called Klebanov Strassler throat? Absolutely, yes, very good. Uh, okay, okay, okay. Yes, very good. And so, and that, that essentially fits. You have heard about Randall syndrome and so on. And Randall syndrome was a toy model in five dimensions or something like, like this, where you can play with the scales depending on how long the, the, these throats are and, and the things that come out of, out of calculation. So it's, uh, I, I, will, I will say probably a bit more about this later on. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, okay. So by, the way, the picture is, the, by the way, the picture is looking excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Okay, so at least that, that's, that's the you know, illustration what it is. Um, okay, but the problem that we face is model stabilization, and I cannot overemphasize this problem. This has been the main problem for any theory in extra dimensions. So once anybody starts thinking about extra dimensions, people ask you, the first thing they ask you, so why don't we see the extra dimensions? And then the standard explanations, oh, they may be very small that we, we don't see them. And like uh, you, you always tell, oh, the, the smallest uh, distance you can see in nature is, is, I don't know, 10 to the minus 18 meters or so coming from LHC. Um, <clears throat> and beyond that, you wouldn't see. So that means that, that uh, anything that is smaller than that can, uh, can be there. And so there are all these extra dimensions that we may not uh, see. Uh, that's a nice talk, but of course, you, it has to come out of a calculation. You have to be able to compute this uh, size of the extra dimensions and, and, and then uh, uh, and then out of the calculation, you have to say, oh, this come out to be very small and we don't see them. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the thing. So that's the first point. The second point is that um, the, this, the, the, there are this called modeling. Modeling is, is the different fields. Can imagine components of the metric. The metric is GMN, and it will have four components, G mu nu, which are the, our space time, four dimensional space time, but all the extra components, G, uh, sorry, I don't know, five, six, or G is seven, eight, and so on. They are all scalar fields in our four-dimensional um, perspective. And these scalar fields are the, what is called the moduli. And then they can take any value. Uh, and if, if, if we don't fix them, so that means that they are flat potentials, totally flat potentials, and they're not determined. And that means that they will have, uh, they will be massless particles and they will be mediating long range interactions. So they'll give you fit forces, which are essentially ruled out by experiments. So in that sense, from the experimental perspective, you also have to find a way to, to, to give a mass to these particles. So this has been the major obstacle for any theory in extra dimensions, in particular for string theory. And uh, so, <clears throat> so something that I will concentrate in, in, in the next uh, uh, few slides. Uh, uh, but before I do that, I want to separate the two issues. One is the standard model part, where I'm putting it into, into these D brains. I will have here this, the gauge group, the quarks and leptons and so on. And they are just in one 
points uh, of this extra dimension, but on top of you, we have the general uh, Calabi-Yau. And I will concentrate on studying this general Calabi-Yau. And at some point, we can use, uh, if we find something that is, is okay, we can attach a, 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 a brain, uh, satisfying some cons uh, consistency requirements, and get the matter field. So in that sense, that's a, a, just a, a, a procedure that we use for being to be able to keep uh, track of our calculations is not something we're imposing uh, by hand or anything I mean, by, by 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 some other, other uh, origin but it's just to to organize our calculations so we just separate the issues related to the standard model number of families and so on we separate them from the global issues which are the 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 the, the size of the extra dimensions and so on and that you can do very easily in type 2b uh, there's nothing wrong with the other ones, but uh, in particular for type 2b, you can actually do it uh, and then would concentrate on this particular string theory from now on. Uh, and uh, again, uh, uh, Fernando, I had one more question in the uh, yes, yes. slide. Mm -hmm. uh, like, what, what exactly uh, you want to mean by local and global uh, model building here? Yes, very good. Yes. Um, Imagine uh, in the heterotic case, I told you that to start with, you have the metric and the symmetric terms, but you also had gauge fields. Mm -hmm. So when you compactify to four dimensions, uh, uh, in four, you, you see in the, in the gauge fields are present from the beginning. So in the whole calabi you see the, uh, the, that uh, any point of the calabi you will you will see from your four dimensional space time perspective, uh, the, the gauge fields are there globally. Whereas in the case if you have the, the gauge fields or the standard model on a brain, they're localized in the brain, that's the word local. So I call this local and this global. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, so in that sense, the standard model is localized, but outside from this point, all these parts, we, you, you don't see the standard model here. Okay, but, so uh, this is but, the global part. Uh, like, and then you can separate local questions from glo global questions, and that, that helps you to organize your, your calculations. So you can just concentrate on the local. Imagine you can do, you want to understand, oh, I want to have three families with the copies of the quarks and, and, and so such that I have some <clears throat> uh, good Yukawa couplings or something that, so I will just do this. I don't have to worry about the whole Calabilla. I will just concentrate here and study the, 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 the string uh, theory here. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I want to un understand cosmology, I need to understand all the global issues because I need to understand this, uh, the, the, how to stabilize the model, like how to fix the size of the extra dimension on the shape. So I need the whole picture of the Calabria. So that's the global picture. But this global issue, is this connected with the cycles, a number of cycles of the Calabria? Yes, it's in general, because you have to see the whole Calabria uh, 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 structure, whereas in, in the local issue, you will just continue, you will be fitting, sitting just at, at one of these the cycles and forget about the rest. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Right, very good. Okay, so uh, and that's again. So this is the model, the the, uh, the 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 model stabilization issue in type two B, and and as I said, uh, these Calabi-Yaus have non-trivial four cycles, four-dimensional cycles, and the four cycles have a dual, which is the perpendicular thing you say here. That would be two cycles because two plus four is six, mm -hmm. and then you have three cycles here and their dual which will be another three cycle that will go there and three plus three is six so the sizes of the three cycles are called complex structure moduli and will be determined by you and the size of the four cycles are called Keller moduli and we usually call them t okay so the big challenge is to find a way to fix the size of the uh, of the four cycles and the three cycles so, so that's that's the, and there are no one cycles or five cycles in Calabria. So it's a, it's a general proof. So in that sense, this is the only thing we need. If we fix four cycles and three cycles, that we fix everything. Okay, and before I start with any proposal to, to stabilize the model, um, there is a big, big problem, which is called um, the dyne cyber problem. And that came out very early in the, in, the, in the development of string theory. And the problem is the following. I want to emphasize it because this is key. Imagine you have a potential for a field. This field can be the overall volume of the whole color yard. Or could be this field I call the dilaton that at the end determines the, 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 the coupling, the string coupling. 
the, 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 the G of the string coupling. <clears throat> so for zero coupling or for infinite volume, we have a solution, which is this 10 dimensional string theory. So in, uh, so in that sense, the potential has to go to zero. Uh, so this sigma says the volume. So the potential has to go to zero at infinite volume. So you have uh, uh, zero uh, uh, energy, a very uh, well-defined solution uh, at infinity. Okay, so, you, but that's not the solution we want. Because we, that will be, the tell oh, you will be living in 10 dimensions. We want the solution for finite volume. So uh, a particular a volume, a volume of, uh, here, for instance. And, uh, <clears throat> and for that, then there is this obstacle because in string theory, there's an issue about, uh, we only know it perturbatively. So in expansion in large volume, in one of the inverse powers of the volume, or expansions in the string coupling, G, G squared, G cube, and so on. And, uh, and this field could be the overall volume or could be one over G, which is the delta. time. <clears throat> so only in this region, which is where when the volume is very large, approaching infinity, we can trust the theory because this is what perturbation theory is well-defined. The volume is very large, so one over the volume is very small, and you can make the expansion one over the volume. That is called uh, the alpha prime expansion. Or if sigma is like a string coupling, uh, is the inverse string coupling. Is so again, this is a, the, 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 the string perturbation theory powers in one over g, one over g squared, and so on. And uh, so this is the region, the only region we can trust the, the theory. And if there is a minimum, that's Dine and Cyber argue in 1985, if there is another minimum besides the, the trivial one, then uh, most probably it has to go at strong coupling because then all the quantum effects have to, to conspire to give you a new minimum. And if that's true, then that means by definition that you are breaking perturbation theory. And then all the string theory uh, machinery that is based on perturbation theory will break down. And, uh, uh, and then we don't, we cannot say anything about this minimum. That's how it, it took, it took many, many years to try to address this problem because this is a very serious in general problem. It's, you know, the paper is a three pages paper, it's very simple with a couple of uh, drawings like this, <laughs> um, but it's very general and very, very far reaching. And it's a big challenge for the string theory. So the question is, can, can we go around this dime cyber problem at all? Otherwise we will be, leaving say in volumes of order one or string couplings of order one means perturbation theory is breaking down. So uh, Fernando, yes? uh, if we just uh, think of this black potential, now if uh, like, suppose one particle is uh, uh, like, so you can see that there, there, are, there might be few possibilities, like one particle go uh, follow this runway part, and uh, like don't stop because the, it, 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 it will go like roll down up to yeah. infinity or might be go to the minimum or yeah. there might be another possibility that particle will come uh, follow this sharp path of the yeah. potential now i'm saying that is there is any possibility to to tunnel the potential also to oh yes in the yes, very good. That's a very good point. I, I will address. That's one of the a few slides on that because that's what that's what I'm working at the moment. Yes. Okay. Okay. The tunneling is is very very is 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 is, is a natural quantum effect that should be taken into account. And, and yes, that's very important. Okay. Yes. Yes. Just yes. We got a few few slides and I will go I will go there. Very good. So okay. So that's that's the 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 line cyber problem. And. Uh, so I, I just drew here three different potentials just to give you an idea that, uh, uh, that essentially the important thing that we have, the only thing we have full control is this. And actually this dine cyber problem has been revived recently in, this, in terms of this um, uh, Swamblank conjecture that I will mention also later on. Okay, so approaches to address this dine cyber problem. The first one is was called the racetrack models. And they said, let's take S say, to be uh, this dilaton field, which is the one with string coupling. And uh, you have a, a super potential for it. And it's the sum of two exponentials, minus two pi S over N and minus two pi S over M. These are natural things to consider because just it's a non-perturbative effect that goes like E to the minus one over G squared. 
and the uh, one over g squared is this field s and uh, and m and n are two integers like say, say the m or n of s u n for a gauge theory or so <clears throat> and if you have two different gauge groups with different values of of uh, of, the, of, the, of the of the rank s u n and s u m for instance then you have a potential a super potential that this that generates a scalar potential and the minimum comes out to be n times m divided by m minus n times the log of this quantity. So the the the, um, the point here is that if n are, and m are very large, and m minus n is not that large, so m minus n is of order one, say n times m, n and m are of order n ten or so or hundred. So you can have a big number here, and if you have a big number. That means s is big, and s is one over g. And so that means that, or one over g squared, and then that means that g is very small. And then you can find a minimum, and then you can uh, uh, overcome the Dine-Siler problem. So that means that it is not that you have to go to a strong coupling, but that you have new parameters in your theory, which are this large, the, the number of colors or so, that can help you to bring the, the minimum to a region that you can trust the calculation. And uh, that came out in uh, 1980s, late 1980s, by Krasnikov. Uh, <clears throat> it has been revived uh, uh, very often after that, uh, but that that is the main idea. So you you have new parameters. You, you know, string theory. I probably forgot to say, string theory. One of the main points of the string theory is that there are no free parameters. So every single thing that we talk about at string theory in terms of coupling, so and so, will be expectation values of fields. Like uh, in the case of the Higgs, the expectation value of the Higgs. Uh, so in this case, this field S, the expectation value of S, will be one over the gist of the scoping. And the expectation value of one of the volume modulus is, is the volume of the color yellow and so on. <clears throat> and so in this sense, they say, well, there may be new parameters given the, the particular structure of the models, where there are numbers, which are integers in this case, M and N, and then you can play with these integers and you can, you can find a way to find a minimum that where you can trust the population theory. That's it. That's one example. Uh, in the 1990s, there's another uh, approach which is using T or S duality, which is a duality in, in string theory that T is, say, for instance, the overall uh, size of extra dimensions, and one over T is small. So, uh, so there's a, co a correlation between T and one over T, and and, so, and that will give you or, or S and one over S, where S is the S is the, the coupling, which is weak to strong coupling. That's what's called T and S duality, and uh, and then they have nice properties in terms of uh, what is called modular forms. And then you can look for modular uh, potentials in terms of all the, this modular form. This is the eta, the decan eta function uh, of t. And then look for a potential that you can find minimum. And here the minima are for the one for t. And and they say, well, it's not. Uh, it's, uh, we may not trust perturbation theory, but it, the, maybe this, the the duality symmetry is helping us, and we can trust duality. And then you can find minima. In the region which balance average say are dangerous, but um, still the symmetries uh, uh, give us a, a hint that that we can still enter into the strong coupling or small volume regime. Uh, so in both of these cases, uh, they were very limited, and uh, of course, usually the potential, the minimum was a very very large negative cosmological constant, and so on. So it was not very very realistic at all. It's only in the years in the two thousands that flux compactifications came out. And that, that is what I will concentrate in the rest of my talk. And this is the work of uh, setting collaborators, Giddens collaborators, and many other people that consider fluxes in, 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 in Calabial manifolds. And I will tell you more or less a rough, uh, rough idea of what this means. So <clears throat> going back to the picture of the, of the extra dimension. So this is the Calabial, uh, the, sorry, this is our three special dimensions. And one point in that special dimension is, is one Calabial, say. But since you have these cycles, the four cycles or three cycles that I was talking about, uh, you can have fluxes like a, you, th you can think or imagine like a magnetic fluxes, uh, <clears throat> or in the field, like a, in a monopole case or something, um, that uh, they are quantized. Uh, so the flux is, fluxes are quantized because of uh, the right quantization condition. And so they give you integers. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, and the, this integer will be as, uh, Roughly speaking, will be the number of flux lines you can have uh, in that. And 
So here, the equivalent of these magnetic monopoles will be, again, this anti-symmetric tensor field that I was telling you at the beginning, <clears throat> with three indices. <clears throat> and once you have that, they essentially, once they're surrounding the, 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 the corresponding uh, cycle, and they try to stabilize it. Essentially, that's the overall the, 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 the intuition about that. And, and uh, so, and we will do that in the case of um, type 2b, as I said before. And there are two scenarios that I will discuss, KKLT and LVS, and I will tell you what they are. Um, again, I emphasize that we concentrate on type 2b for some, for, because there we can do the calculations, but the, in principle, they can be done something in the other string theories. And this, since they are all equivalent to each other, uh, it's, it's, it, this should be enough. OK. So now some equations. Uh, uh, one question before going yes. through this. Mm -hmm. uh, this KKLT and uh, LBA scenarios can be differentiated from the perspective of the supersymmetry breaking? Uh, can be differentiated from? From the supersymmetry breaking? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I, I, will, I will go through, through both of them because essentially the, the whole talk is about exploring the physics of these two scenarios. So okay. yes, yes, I will tell you. Yes, <clears throat> very good. Okay, so let me write some equations for type 2b, very concrete. So the massless states that we have are the metric, the two indices of the symmetric tensor, I call it B2, for which the field strength, like uh, imagine here like a gauge field, so now only with an extra index, the field strength is, has three indices. And I have phi, which is the dilaton, where e, e to the phi will be the string coupling, G is the string. And uh, well, the names NS and S is just for is the Schwarz and Schwarz sector and Ramon Ramon sector. Uh, it's, it's 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 not relevant for what I have to do. It's just names. Then we have C zero. Zero means the scalar, like an axiom. C two is another anti-symmetric tensor for which the field strength I call F three. So now we have two different asymmetric tensors of of the same number of indices, three. And then C four, which is, has four anti-symmetric tensors, and the field strength will have five indices. <laughs> okay, so that, that's the starting point in 10 dimensions. In, when you go to four dimensions, you can construct the field S, which is a complex field, out of the phi, which is the dilaton, and the C0, which is the action. So it is minus phi plus I C0. So this is the field I was talking about before. Uh, like I said, e to, e to the phi is the G string, is the string coupling, so E to the minus phi is one over G string. And C0 is, 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 is an action field, it's a pseudo-scalar. And then there is this field called the complex structure moduli, which I call U. Is the, as I told you, is the size of the three cycles, or the three non-trivial cycles of the Calabias. And the number of, of, those, of those cycles is a, is, what, is a Hodge number called H12. It's, the, it's just a, one and two refers to the number of holomorphic and anti-holomorphic indices. <laughs> And the Keller model, the size of the four cycles, I call them T, Ti, there are many of them, also, which have a, a real and imaginary part. And there are two types of them, T and G. Uh, G I will, uh, are just, uh, are, are all, all, in some cases, they're not present, so I will just concentrate on the most relevant ones, which are T, U, and S. Okay, so these are fields that come from, from the most of the metric and so on. <clears throat> so for instance, this, Tau i will have will be the volume of that four cycle, which is called D. And, and out of that, all the tau as you be the, the whole volume of the Calabria. And the B i's are the uh, are determined in terms of the C4 and so on. So the 10 dimensional fields gives rise to these four dimensional fields. Okay. Uh, mm. One more question. Yeah, no problem. Uh, 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 when you were talking about the moduli stabilization, uh, yes. so you want to uh, stabilize this. U's and S? We want to select all the three of them, S, U, and T. The three, the three S, here. U, and T. Yes. But uh, here, uh, during uh, modular stabilization, you, you are not interested in C2 and C4. C2, oh, yeah, no, C2 and C4, they are the fields in 10 dimensions. And they give uh -huh. rise to the fields in four dimensions um, uh, from, from uh, uh, for instance, let me see. Um, as I told you, for instance, C4, for instance, C4 gives rise to BI, and BIs are the imaginary parts of the fields tau i. Ah, okay, okay. For instance, yes. So, for instance, the, and then C2 gives rise to these other fields and so on. So, essentially, all the 10 dimensional fields 
at the end, combinations of them give you the four dimensional fields. And they are naturally uh, uh, captured into these T's, U's, and S. And, and I emphasize there are many alpha, there are many U's, H1, yeah, T. Yeah, yeah, I can understand. And this can be hundreds or so, that's important. And there are many T's that are labeled by H11, and again, it can be hundreds or thousands. So this, these are the fact that the Calabiaos has many of these cycles is a key thing to, to, to what I'm going to say next. Yeah, one more thing is, like mm -hmm. once you are talking about moduli is that uh, basically represents the distance between the throat where deep brain is there with the deep the d bar right exactly very very good the throats are determined in general for by the corpus structure model by the use yeah and the overall volume is determined by the t's essentially and, and S is, is not related to the, to, the, uh, to the manifold because it comes directly from the dilaton field in the, in, the, in the 10 dimensions. So essentially the U's and T's are the moduli that I was telling you, three cycles and four cycles. This guy gives quarks that they give you the, the throats and the T's give you the overall volume, the volume of the shoulder cycle, but also the overall volume of the six dimension. Okay, very good. And again, the H12 and H11 are topological numbers. Is the, is called the Hodge numbers, and as I said, it can be hundreds or thousands in the each of them, in the in the and, and that's how they determine the number of calabellos. And the, the many for a given calabellos, we have many of them. But this there plus and calabellos. minus represents the charges. Sorry, the plus and minus on the Hodge oh, yes. number. It, it is uh, sorry, it's a little bit technical thing is uh, because on top of that we have to do some twist which is called an orientifold twist okay and this twist uh, some of them are invariant under the twist that's the plus and the ones that change to the minor themselves are are, are, are called minus but okay. it's a bit technical thing that doesn't play that much of a role here so i would not okay good <laughs> okay so and then then the then we have since it is an effective field theory of, uh, uh, with one supersymmetry, so the natural is, is set up is, is a supergravity. And then the supergravity is determined by is called the Kerr potential and the superpotential. And the Kerr potential has been computed at uh, the lowest order, so at three levels, say, and is minus two log of the whole volume, which is a function of the, of the T fields, minus log of the S plus S bar, which is the, the dilaton, minus log of this quantity, which looks a bit ugly, uh, omega is a three zero form, which is unique in Calabria. The important thing is that it depends on the complex structure moduli. So this gives a dependence on the complex structure moduli. So it's very, very precise and well computed. And the other quantity that appears in the, in the supersymmetric uh, theories in supergravity is the superpotential. And the superpotential is, and this is crucial, is G3 which omega. Omega is the same omega here, but G3 is F3 plus ISH3, where F3 and H3 are the field strengths that are of the two antisymmetric tensors I told you that they are there. <clears throat> so once you have a super potential, then you will have a scalar potential. And the, the scalar potential will depend on the U fields because of here and will depend on the S fields because of this. And this F3 and, and H3 will be the fluxes that I was telling you about, wrapping the, this, each of these three cycles. And they will give you, the number of them will give you different integers. This is the number of flux lines that I was telling you, n here and m there, and uh, <clears throat> and as I said, said, there are many of them. So you have integers which are more or less arbitrary, and there are many of these integers, and uh, you satisfy the equations, and they are still left with uh, many free parameters, which are all these integers, n k and m k. <clears throat> An important point is that this w at the tree level. Depends on the U fields and depends on the S fields, but not on the T fields. So at this point, we can generate the potential for U and S, but not T. Okay. And the scalar potential is already known in the, in supergravity theories. It's just e to the k times the uh, k inverse di w dj w minus three w squared. That's the what is called the F term of the scalar potential where this covariant derivative is defined by this, the derivative of W plus W times the derivative of K. And when you plug that, this is the standard supergravity uh, potential, you plug it into the, 
the the potential, the scalar potential, uh, sorry, the super potential and killer potential that I gave you in the previous slide, you find the, that it can be written like this. Uh, now I lost my, uh, okay, I lost here. And this dependence on the, remember the indices i and j bar were the t indices, and the alpha and beta were the u and s indices. So in the case of the t indices, since the superpotential does not depend on them, this gives you that, and precisely the shape of the carrier potential is such that this gives you zero. This is very important because in supersymmetry, the scalar potential has this positive part, positive definite part, minus this positive definite part. So the scalar potential can be positive or negative. So Fernando, yes, uh, are you only considering uh, the F part of the potential, not the D part? Only the F term, yes. Because uh, like D part also con uh, contains this Fiat Iliopoulos. Uh, yeah, Iliopoulos terms, exactly, yeah. yes. Yeah, very good. Yes, uh, yes, at this point, I only consider that the F term, uh, because this is, uh, it's, it goes more or less like a, when I was telling you that I separate the local issues but from the global issues, uh -huh. uh, in the case, the, the D part will, will depend on the, on the local issues, on, on, on the matter field that you have, the corresponding gauge field and so on, and that is more model dependent. Okay. The, the F term here is, is more model independent, so I will concentrate on this first, but uh, I will not forget about the D terms. The D terms will appear uh, uh, later on because they play an important role. So just, 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 Yes, uh, just keep up with that and remind me later on because this is important. But the important part is that uh, here is that uh, then these three cancels. This is a magical cancellation here with the shape of the carry potential that we have there. Precisely this combination K inverse KK is equal, happens to be equal to three. So this cancels for any number of, of, of killer moduli and so on. And that's important because that was uh, once you cancel that, the, the whole scalar potential is positive, definite, positive, semi-definite. And, uh, and then you can, uh, then the minimum will be where these DWs are zero. And the DW is zero with respect to S and the U is also zero. That fixes both U and S, so very sim relatively simple equations. And that will give you, uh, once you solve the question, you can plug it back and give you uh, the value, the effective value of the super potential at three level. This is where all the, the richness of the so solutions are. At the beginning, we started with all directions flat. Now they're all lifted, but because you find minimum of, of the potential by just solving these equations for U and S. And there are many solutions because there are many integers uh, in case. And, um, <clears throat> and they'll give you a huge amount of, 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 of uh, of, of, of uh, solutions and each minimum will be say a different universe, a different, uh, uh, um, yes, a different universe. Um, however, at this stage, all the T directions are still flat. So you have minimum in one directions in, in the minute and the use and S directions, but in the T directions, this is flat. Uh, how many solutions? Yes, it depends on the number of these cycles that you have in Calabellos. And it can be of order 10 to the 400, 10 to the thousands and so on. <clears throat> and that's what defines what is people call the flux landscape. Okay. All the solutions are Binkowski because I told you that the, 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 the scalar potential is positive, semi-definite, and the minimum is when these quantities are zero, so the potential goes to zero. And that means you have a flat uh, uh, Minkowski solution. And uh, both the T fields are flat. Uh, from that you can compute, for instance, uh, uh, what is called the F term of the T field. The F term is different from zero, so you, natural supersymmetry is broken. And by broken supersymmetry, you can compute the mass of the gravitino, which is the partner of the graviton, in terms of the volume and the superpotential and the Planck scale. So this is, if the volume is large, uh, this is smaller, or, or W0 is small, the gravitino mass is lighter than the Planck scale. <clears throat> okay, naturally, the value of W0 is a order one. But since you have so many solutions, people have argued that you may be able to tune them to have values of W0 to be smaller than one. And we, I will emphasize that. Yeah, like I just want to ask one more issue because that is a very serious issue in this context, which is called ETA problem. 
the ether problem, yes? Yeah, so like sometimes we know that, uh, so like is that eta problem is a generic problem with the uh, F-term potential or it's completely depend on specific model? I think it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's not, a, um, it's, the, the, of course you can address it from model to model, uh, but it's, it's very generic, that's in the fact the eta problem is essentially that you have to tune the potential to get it to get a, a flat potential to give inflation, for instance. Uh -huh. uh, and and, and uh, he, here is very generic. So usually uh, it's difficult to get a potential which is flat enough to give you uh, inflation. And they have to do some tuning of 1% at the most. And so that, that uh, I, I will show you some uh, um, examples later on about inflation, but yes, it, it will, it's always an issue. Okay. And then we can write the four dimensional effective fraction in terms of the scalar potential and so super potential and scalar potential and what's called the gauge kinetic function. We, we compute uh, the, the whole super potential now. Uh, is the same super potential we had before. Plus now the super potential is, is a holomorphic quantity in terms of the moduli. Uh, and it once you compute the tree level, it is exact to all orders of perturbation theory. This is called the non-normalization theory. But then there are corrections uh, at a, a non-perturbative level. And these corrections are of the order e to the minus a t, and t is, you can see it as a, as a, as a gauge coupling, one over g squared. So it goes like e to the minus one over g squared, because this is a, t's are the corresponding gauge coupling for the matter fields in, the, in, the, in the, these seven brains I was showing you in the, in the first figures. And uh, so this is the source, now this non-perturbative thing, is the source of the potential for the T-fields that we were still missing to stabilize. Uh, so fluxes themselves fix the U and S fields. Then you have to consider all this is only at tree level. You have to look for corrections beyond tree level. There are corrections to the carrier potential to all orders, but there are corrections also to super potential, only non-perturbative. And uh, <clears throat> both can combine to fix the values of the T fields, and that's, that's the, 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 the general result. Uh, how am I doing with time, uh, Sayantan? Because it looks, how many time do we have? You have time, so you can continue. I will tell you. Okay. Half an hour ago. Okay, okay. But how, how long have, have I been talking, just to have a, an idea myself? So you have finished your one hour. I finished one hour, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so I have uh, more than one hour to go. Yeah, yeah, then you don't need to point. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, um, and then in, uh, uh, there are perturbative and non-perturbative corrections. In general, the carrier potential has three level perturbative corrections and non-perturbative corrections, which are called uh, K0 plus J, J are this, uh, the sum of these two. And the super potential has three level and non-perturbative corrections. There are no perturbative corrections to, to W. Then the scalar potential will be uh, the zero, the three level potential plus the corrections due to the corrections of the carrier potential plus corrections due to the uh, super potential plus combinations of them. We can compute what these things are. And you said, well, this uh, perturbation theory is okay. All these terms are, are sub leading. However, here, as I told you, the V0 happens to be zero. It's a zero because it's a constant, it's zero potential. So then the leading order is the first, is the, is the dominant correction uh, for, for the carrier potentials, uh, for, for the scalar potential in general. And so usually perturbative corrections are dominant over non-perturbative corrections because perturbative corrections are go like one over G, whereas non-perturbative go like E to the minus one over G. Uh, so the natural thing to expect is that the corrections to the carrier potential will be the dominant one. Uh, and and uh, in that case, uh, that's the scen one scenario, this is called the large volume scenario that we developed uh, for um, 15 years ago. Unless the super potential of fluxes can be very small. And in that case, uh, the non-perturbative corrections dominate and that's the KKLT scenario. So I will concentrate on this too. So the, I will give you a, a, brief, a brief overview of KKLT. <clears throat> Uh, because that's the first scenario that that that, that also includes the the, the Sitter solutions. Um, so you have a non-perturbative potential, as I told you before, 
and you minimize and the, the minima, then you find you fix every all the fields this the s the t's and the s and the u's uh, <clears throat> But the minimum happened to be anti-decitor. That means a negative cosmological constant. You set all the dw's to zero. Then the famous minus three that we had there uh, dominates because, uh, uh, and then that will give you a negative cosmological constant, which is not what we wanted. We want to have a positive cosmological constant for zero. And so uh, KKLT, KKLT means um, Castro, Carlos, Lindy, and Trivelli. That was in 2003. They propose that on the tip of one of these throats that I was showing you before, you can also attach an anti D3 brain. That means that the, the D3 brain with opposite charges as the D3 brains. And that contributes a positive part to the energy. <clears throat> and, um, and that positive term uh, that's, that gives you a, a, a coefficient here that will depend on this throat, on the, uh, uh, which is a warp factor divided by volume to some power. And that power is three in uh, original KKLT paper, but it was corrected later on by KKL MMT, where MM is McAllister and Maldacena, where alpha equals to two. So you add uh, is, is one over volume to the f uh, four uh, thirds <clears throat> in on top of the of the of what you had. And and times this D square, which is a work factor that will be very small. Once you add that term, you can get this minimum, which is the sitter. And, uh, and I will show you a picture in the, in the next. Uh, similarly, uh, you can do the same for um, in what is called the large volume scenario with the with Balasum Ramani and uh, Berglund, Colin, and myself. I think Colin, myself, and Zerulis in 2005. Um, <clears throat> you have the same, you follow the same structure, this W0 of U and S. Uh, but sorry, I forgot to mention before that this is called the GKPX scenario, Giddens, Kashu, and Kuczynski, that where you can refix the value of W of, of uh, U and S and, and find a W uh, zero. Uh, but then we also consider the perturbative corrections to the killer potential, which have been computed uh, in this terms of this term, this topological term proportional to the Euler number of the Calabria. And then the same non perturbative terms that the KKLT consider. Then the whole potential can be split into two nice parts. The S and U dependence is still the same, goes on one or volume square. And the T dependence that has three terms, two coming from the non perturbative corrections and one coming from the perturbative corrections. Look at the power of the dependence on the volume. This depends on one or the volume cube, it depends on one or the volume square, and it depends on one or the volume. And this is one or the volume square. So for large volume, you will say, oh, this dominates. But however, this times, this has a factor e to the minus two a tau, which is tau is one of this, uh, uh, the volume of one of the cycles. So <clears throat> that means that this coefficient uh, can be very small. And so this term does not dominate. Actually, the dominant term is this one. One of the volume squared is the, is the uh, dominant piece. So that tells you that still dsw and duws are zero. So this, you still find the same minimum that we found before for u and s fields. But here, these three terms, this, this uh, has one over volume, but power e to the minus two tau. This has one over volume square, but the coefficient is e to the minus tau. And this has one over volume cube. So you can see that the three terms actually combine themselves. You have now two fields, tau and volume. And when you minimize, you find that volume is e to the a tau. So if volume is e to the a tau, this goes like one over volume cube. This goes like one over volume cube, and this goes like one over volume cube. And you don't have to tune, to tune at all the W0, W0 is a further one. And if tau, tau happens to be proportional to the, to the string coupling, one over GS, if out of this huge number of solutions that we found for, for the S fields, out of the, of, of the fluxes, many, 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 many of them, I mean, 10 to the hundreds or so, will have uh, the string coupling to be weak. And if the string coupling is weak, one over G is large. So if say, so G strain for given name was say, say it was one over 10, say. So this will be 10. If tau is 10, e to the tau is huge and the volume is then is huge. So that means it, the larger the volume, then the best control you have on your, on your perturbation theory. And, 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 and that is a, 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 a way to, to address this cyber problem. <clears throat> 
in a very explicit manner. So this, again, there was no assumptions rather than just considering the fluxes plus the corrections to the, to the carrier potential. However, this depends crucially on the sign of this term, C, and this depends, is proportional to this quantity Xi, and the Xi is proportional to the Euler number of the Calabellar. And so if the Euler number is positive, you get it, and the Euler number is negative, you don't get it. And essentially it's half and half of the Calabellars have Euler number positive, so that's just. And, um, and as I said before, W0 didn't have to be tuned to any value. So this is the, the, the nice things about this exponential at large volume scenario. Okay, so, <clears throat> but coming back to your question before, Sayantan, uh, is that um, there are also D terms in the scalar potential, and the D terms, they're all positive, semi-definite themselves. They have Fagiliopoulos uh, terms and so on, and they can also actually contribute to the potential and provide uplifting without the need to add anti-brains, for instance. And, uh, so that's what we have done in several papers. Uh, this is the recent one, 2015, which is Chicoli and Valandro, and that is interpreted in terms of brains, something called T brains, and T stands for triangular uh, expression of the 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 of the, of the, of the, of the that that defines the couplings, uh, <clears throat> and uh, um, so. Uh, so this is another way to lift, and there are other ways that people have proposed in the past that are, uh, people have been working. So the first part of fluxes and, um, and corrections, perturbative and unperturbative, are very general. The uplifting part is more model dependent, and the anti-brain is one possibility, but there are others that, that people have worked in the past. So at the end, you have a total F term potential will be can be written as the non-perturbative part, the perturbative part, plus the uplift part. And at the end, you get a nice potential, which is uh, zero, or almost zero at the minimum, then goes to uh, a bump, and then comes back to zero at the end, which is the runaway potential. And then this addresses the dying cyber problem, because you can still have a minimum where in the region that you can trust your, your calculations. But it's not fully under control if you are a purist, because fully under control is only on the on the on the runaway uh, uh, region. But since you have a big uh, play, uh, 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 number of integers to play with to get this uh, uh, <clears throat> minimum of order, uh, uh, la very large volume and very weak coupling, so that means that you have plenty of solutions where you, you can trust your, your, your perturbation theory. So in this uplifting part of the potential, mm -hmm. you have some index A which is running from one to three. So is that uh, can be fractional also? Yes, yes, yes. The, it's model dependent can be a thirds and so on, uh, seven thirds and so on, yes, yes. The important thing is between one and three, if it is, if it is um, bigger than three, it will not uplift because it, it will not dominate any, any, in any part of, your, or, of the field. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, yes, and if it's smaller than one, you you will not trust your effective field theory. So it's essentially uh, uh, between one and three, but any number it will fit it, and then you can play with the coefficients to do so. So the, because one possibility that this uh, oblique in terms is that they just erase the minimum you have, and then you go back to the runaway. So you have to have the right balance in the coefficients to eventually find a minimum and, and uplift to to the sitter. Okay. Um, so this was considered in the 2003 or so a big success. As I told you, I told you we had 100 years since Calusa Klein, the fixed model, and now uh, within the string theory context, something well defined doing what the string theory provides you, you were able to find a minimum that not only fix all the model, but also provides you uh, a possibility to get the sitter space, uh, and given the observations of the expanding accelerating universe, that was very, very, very appealing, and that attracted a lot of attention, say, 15 years ago, and that still is, is the, the, the leading scenario for model stabilization. Um, <clears throat> so let me just say a few words about the, <clears throat> the scale. The important thing, as, as I told you in the first slide, uh, nature also gives us a lot of hierarchies. You have some, you know, the top quark is much heavier than the electrons, for instance, even much heavier than, 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 than the neutrinos and so on. And uh, so, and because of that, we have been able to understand nature by different scales. And here, at least in particular in this uh, large volume scenario, 
we have a, an explanation for some hierarchies in terms of the volume, because many of the quantities depends on the volume in a very particular way. For instance, the string scale, which is the, the, the size of the, the, the so the, the mass of the, of the, of the um, heavy modes from string theory, is proportional to the Planck scale, which we know is 10 to the 19 GB, divided by volume to the one half. The kaluza klein scale, that means that the control the size of the extra dimensions, is the Planck scale divided by volume to two thirds. So if the volume is large, then the string scale is much smaller than the Planck scale, and you can just trust your effective, your, your, your effective field theories because you are below the Planck scale. The, the same thing with kaluza klein modes. You can neglect kaluza klein modes because the <coughs> um, they are heavier, but you know that, that, that you can talk about competitification because um, uh, uh, in effective theory below the planks, the Carlos Klein scale, uh, and, and at energies much smaller than the Planck scale because the Carlos Klein scale is in Planck divided by volume to two thirds. And the fact that this power of the volume is different from this power of the volume also makes sets a hierarchy between the Carlos Klein and the string scale, which is also welcome. The gravitational mass, which is a measure of supersymmetry breaking, is even smaller because it goes like one over the volume. <clears throat> uh, it so happens, which is interesting, the overall volume, the corresponding particle, is, uh, volume modulus, it also has, since it gets stabilized, you can compute its mass, and the mass, it goes like one over the volume to three halves, which is lighter than the gravitino itself. Uh, this is already very curious because usually, as I told you at the beginning, uh, scalar, um, light scalars get contributed to the mass <coughs> uh, and I should send them to the cutoff. So here the cutoff will be the gravitino mass and still these particles at three level, they are lighter than the gravitino mass, but also from loop corrections we have checked, they don't get uh, uh, lifted to the gravitino mass. So you have a prediction that you have um, moduli which are survive at energies below even the supersymmetry breaking scale. And they're even, depending on the model in this case, but it's just something called fiber modeling, where the mass is still smaller than the volume, always, volume to the five thirds. So it, there's a nice uh, hierarchy that I, I can also illustrate it here by providing more details about the string scale, colors of climate, mode, gravitino, and so on. So <clears throat> the interesting case is that the, I told you that the, all the T fields come with the real part and an imaginary part. The, the real part is, for instance, the volume modulus, the imaginary part is an action, corresponding action. It so happens that the action field, the last, the last line here in this slide, that I, I can get my mouse to work, the last line said the volume modulus action, because the, the partner of the action, the, the, you know, the, the partner of the volume in this uh, complex field, uh, the mass is e to the minus volume to two thirds times the Planck scale. So essentially we're predicting also very, 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 very light action, which is also very interesting for cosmology and so on. So it comes out naturally, something that you don't ask for it, it just comes out. <clears throat> so imagine a typical volume is 10 to the six or so. Uh, so e to the minus 10 to the four here times m Planck is essentially very, 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 very small. Uh, it can be you know, 10 to the minus 20 to electron volts or so. Anyway, so. I have a question. Yes, I so am. Yeah. What do you mean by fiber here? Sorry, what do you mean by fiber? Because you have mentioned in the yeah. fiber. Yes, yes. Uh, it it is a mathematical term. It's a um, <clears throat> probably let, let me let me imagine you have um, yes. Imagine you have a torus. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you can consider a torus more or less like a product of a circle times another circle, S1 cross S1. Okay. Okay. So if that is inside a bigger manifold, uh, uh, you have the size of this, is, is, uh, uh, each of the circles, if you want to take one of the circles, if that's the size of that circle depends on the on, on other modules of the on a bigger manifold. So this product to S1 to S1, is true locally, but at every point it will be different because the size of the of, of one of the circles will be smaller, and smaller, and smaller, or bigger and bigger and bigger, depending on how how you change, up to all up to the way that it can even collapse to zero size. So that's called a vibration in the sense that that uh, it is a, the manifold is a direct locally it looks like a direct product of one uh, one sub manifold times another sub manifold, 
but uh, it's only local. Once you move around, uh, that that the the structure of this uh, of this product varies, uh, and then it's, it's called a vibration. Maybe I may have a picture later on, on to illustrate the fiber. Okay. Yes, because that, that's an important because actually my favorite model of inflation is called fiber inflation. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> so it's, good, it's good that. that so there, there is one more question from the audience. Yes, please. Uh, so audience, please ask. Don't type here. You can ask directly to the speaker. So yeah, the question is, what does the zero mean in the volume V0? Oh, it's, it's the value of the volume in, in, the, in the ground state, in the, in the minimum. Because the volume is, is, is a field. It's a particle, it's a field. So then V0 is the value of, the, of V at, at the minimum. It's the expectation value of the volume, say. Vacuum expectation value of the volume. OK. Thank you. Sure. Very good. So as I told you, there are many axioms because all the fields have imaginary parts, which are uh, pseudo-scalars, and they, 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 they are axioms. And some of them get masses at different levels. In particular, so as I mentioned, the mass of the field, the axiom corresponding to the volume, can be uh, 10 to the minus 22 electron volts, so smaller. And they can be a, a candidate for dark energy as a quintessence field. It can be candidate for dark matter as an uh, axiom dominating energy density. Or it can be a, a candidate for dark radiation because it's very light. So, <clears throat> um, okay. So, but then there are other get become massive because of the, something similar to the Higgs effect, uh, or for non-perturbative effects and so on. So there are many actions that is good to to keep track of them. And people have studied uh, the, the effect of string actions very generally. There's a, a famous paper called the Axiverse from uh, Dimoclus et al. that explored that in, in a lot of detail. Okay, and then, well, then you have these two scenarios, the large volume and the KKLT, and they have differences. Probably I will not emphasize too many of the differences because I have to say that I'm more or less one third within my planned talk, so I better try to cover the other, other parts of the talk. But essentially, I, I hope that you got an idea of what, how to this, this um, scenarios work for model stabilization and how important the issue is, because uh, without model stabilization, we cannot talk about any realistic issue about the string theory phenomenology or cosmology. And so that is, is the key thing to, 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 to explore um, uh, physical implications of string theory. <clears throat> and th then people have been uh, constructing concrete models to see, for instance, uh, this is a nice picture of a particular model done by the people above, where you can compute each point is a different vacuum of a different flux vacuum of the, I mean, the different universe. And, uh, and compute the value of the superpotential, the imaginary part and the real part. And you can see they all uh, fall into the ballpark of a 10 to 100 or so. There are very, very, very few small ones. However, this is only for a, a model which is very simple. It has only a few moduli, uh, two or so. Uh, you, in the generic case, will be hundreds of them. And so you expect a huge amount of, of them, and probably some of them with much smaller values. Of W0 because the KKLT scenario needs W0 to be very, very, very small. I mean, 10 to the minus 8 or 10 to the minus 9 or so. So you, you need uh, to see if that, that can be realized. In the large volume scenario, you don't need And the large volume scenario is perfectly realized with this W0. <clears throat> okay, so that brings us to the string landscape. And that has been um, a, the subject of, of debate for the last uh, 15 years or so. So let me just try to to say some words. So the picture that we get, and uh, I warn you at the beginning, this is just a cartoon. And again, this is taken from the Scientific American paper of Bruce and Polchinski. The picture is that we have a lot of minima now, each one corresponding to a different distribution of fluxes and calabiyals and fluxes, different fluxes. So give you different minima of the potential. And uh, so how many of them? You just 10 to the few hundreds or 10 to the thousand or so. Uh, <clears throat> Each of them will be a different universe, uh, stable in the sense that are minimal of scalar potential. But as you say, Sanyantan is, is that uh, there can be some tunneling, since everything is quantum mechanically at the end. So you can go, you can decay, uh, you can make a transition from any minimum to any other minimum in principle. And that's the picture that people get about the, what is called the, the, the string landscape. So you can have not only a huge number of Solutions. Each solution is a different universe, so you have a, a huge number of universes. But you can do tunneling from one universe to the next. 
and thus populating the landscape. <clears throat> I emphasize that this, this is just a cartoon because contrary to the potentials that I was drawing for you before, here I cannot draw a potential to go from this minimum to the zone of the minimum. So this is in the space of the U and S field, which I, I, uh, I know the minimum, but I don't, I don't know the whole shape of the potential because this will be, you will need a, 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 a full string 10 dimensional picture that we don't have. It's only effective field theory. Um, so in that sense, uh, we only know that there are minima, there are solutions with different values of the cosmonic constant. So the value of the, the energy is the cosmonic constant, of course. And uh, so that's, 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 that's the, the thing that we have so far. And uh, so that gives you this multiverse picture that you can start with one universe and expand, and then in some place you can decay to, a, to another universe, hopefully at the smaller cosmological constant, and this one also expands and then decays to another one and so, and we happen to be in only one of them. And then there's a huge uh, amount of uh, universes. And this is the, I show the famous um, Andre Linde's uh, picture of the, of, uh, of the multiverse in views you have uh, we don't know what happened at the, at the beginning, but we may be in the middle of that when we come from the transition from one universe to another universe. So that's a, that's a nice picture. The impressive thing that that I was uh, used be, even before all this uh, development as a, an idea that Buson Polchinski came up in the year 2000, uh, somehow following the, the work of Weinberg in 1987, <clears throat> and it's just, so this is a two-dimensional plot uh, of all this uh, n n integers n n n one n two sorry. Uh, so for any just pick any value of the of, of your vacuum energy cosmological constant. So this is a circle here, and within the circle you have a, a big enough distribution of of uh, solutions. A, a, each point is a solution. It's a different universe. You will fit in a narrow band. At least one, a few of them that can fit into your into your value of the cosmological constant for any value you want. So essentially, you can have uh, values here and there. And so that means that what is the problem we have with the cosmological constant now or dark energy is that uh, it's not only <clears throat> um, we wanted to explain what it was essentially zero. Now we want to explain not only that it's very uh, it's not zero first and that is extremely small second and then in this in this approach you have many integers n n1 and n2 and as i told you we have for each cycle we have a different integer and, uh, and there are hundreds of cycles and the integers can take many values so you have a, that's why we have this 10 to the hundreds or 10 to the thousand solutions and so the fact that you can for any, any value of the vacuum energy you can find solutions and then it looks that we may be living in one of them and uh, so this, as I said, it was predicted uh, in one, from Weinberg, 1987. The, he says that that means that if, if the cosmological constant is small, different from zero, then that means that this anthropic explanation for that. People usually don't like the word anthropic, but uh, what can we do? That, that, that's, that's, uh, um, and and he Weinberg also didn't like it, but he says he's being a top physicist. He said, well, okay, let's assume that there is an anthropic explanation for the cosmological constant. So you have to have lambda to be 10 to the minus something 20 or so. <clears throat> Otherwise, we couldn't have existed. Or the universe will expand too fast or, or, or collapse. Or, and, and, and then he started the, the details about the galaxies and so on, the formation of galaxies and so on. And uh, so there was a prediction, 1987. In between Weinberg and Polchinski, Bruce Polchinski, there was in the 1990s, it was the, the, the discovery of dark energy. So in that sense, Weinberg was predicted, predicted that, say, 10 years before the discovery. And precisely at, in the range that Weinberg proposed, which is very impressive already. But Weinberg didn't have a, co a concrete mechanism to, to get why this anthropic part. So then Busso, with Busso-Polchinski, with the idea I presented you in the previous slide, they provided a concrete mechanism. So you have many fluxes. At some point, you can explain something very, which is very small. And it's not on something very small. The cosmological constant problem is not just to get a small number. It's just to get something small, which is a stable amount with uh, quantum corrections. And in this case, that does it because when you, when you fix it, you fix it after all the uh, quantum corrections. So that's a, 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 a concrete 
result from Bosomczynski, but they didn't have a concrete realization within a fundamental theory. And that's what the work of KKLT and others did uh, uh, with, with this uh, um, structure of, 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 uh, of uh, flux compactifications. So I find that very um, interesting, at least development, that uh, it was a theory, then experiment, and then uh, further development on the theory, and then a more concrete realization of the theory. And that's how this attracted so much attention. But uh, attracting so much attention also attracted a lot of reaction because most, most people don't like it. In particular, I don't, I don't like that solution. I didn't like it. I, I, the thing I want to, I, like, I always like to say is to repeat this sentence I, uh, I like to always repeat, is that this happens to be the worst solution of the dark energy problem with the exception of all the others. <clears throat> So I think we have to take it seriously because I don't think we have a, a better candidate, but it's, it, it has a very rich structure. It's not, just, it's not just in a speculation and that people who would take, would have, which have a good taste will not like it. And uh, of course, nature doesn't like what taste we have and we have to take it seriously. And, uh, <clears throat> and in the context of many universes, what this is telling us is nothing deep. It's just telling us that, of course, uh, the, what we thought it was a deep question, why this thing? Because molecular constant is so small. It happens to be not a good question because we just happen to, it's, it's small because we happen to, to be in a place where it's small and we couldn't live in a place where it's, which is not that small. So, so in that sense, it's, uh, it reduces the importance of the explanation somehow. <clears throat> okay, so, so the landscape is good because it gives us a solution, the dark energy problem, something, um, in the times of supersymmetry, for instance, when we, we, we have been uh, still the, the best explanation for the, for, for the hierarchy problem I mentioned at the beginning, uh, there was a big uh, question mark on, on any attempt like supersymmetry to solve the hierarchy problem because he was assuming somehow that, that the biggest hierarchy problem, which is the cosmological constant problem, was solved by something else that we don't know, and then say supersymmetry will solve why the mass of the Higgs is small. Uh, so that was not very appealing because you say, if there's something that we ignore that solves the cosmological constant problem, that may also solve the, the hierarchy problem and then supersymmetry may not be needed. Uh, here is the one, not necessarily. Now, now we have, a, we can actually say there's something that addresses the cosmological constant problem and then supersymmetry may be used to solve the hierarchy problem. So that's, that's good. That's the good part. It's bad, I think, because it missed an opportunity. Of course, the cosmological constant has been such a big challenge for us for many generations for, uh, that, uh, and being a low energy issue, so we expected to learn new low energy physics. And it so happens that uh, if this is the solution, we don't learn that much new low energy physics because there's no new physics at that scale. It's just that we, we live there. <clears throat> and I say it's ugly in some sense because now the, uh, we can use anthropic arguments based on multiverse to address one physics question, people get tempted. So why don't we use it to solve any questions? Uh, so I, for that, I think uh, uh, we have to separate the fact that the cosmological constant is not a good question. It doesn't mean that there are not good questions. So there are many other questions that should be good. So we have to separate the questions that are solved by the environments, say by the being in our universe, to the questions which are in general. So that's something we have always to address. <clears throat> Okay, but yet, I don't think it's, it's yet a solution. It's, it, it, in the sense that, as I told you, we have uh, been able to fix the moduli, the, the, uh, explicitly in concrete models, for very few moduli, for uh, H12 or for two or three or so, but we needed to do it for hundreds of them. For that, we need a huge computational machinery. I don't know, hopefully machine learning or something can help to do that, but it's not done yet. I know some people are working on that, so it may, it may, it may be positive in the future. We also need to populate the landscape. This picture of growing, jumping from one uh, back into another one is also um, <clears throat> an issue that we have to address to see if it actually, if it actually happens. I, I will address this in a few other slides. And uh, then the distribution of fluxes. We had to find them more. Uh, if, if, uh, in the picture I showed you about Busso Pinchiski, the fluxes were more or less distributed in a uniform way, but, but uh, probably it may, there may be many fluxes, but they're all concentrated in one single value of the cosmological constant, so it, it is not natural to have a particular one. So you have to be explicit that I'm fine to see there is a real distribution of all the fluxes uh, uh, for different values of the cosmological constant. So, and, and, this, and the tuning that you can do to, to, to get something more like W0 
it has to be uh, done in a way that you can do it. You have a uniform distribution, which is almost dense uh, uh, number of, of fluxes. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so that's the landscape. And there has been a reaction uh, against the landscape, which is called the swamp length. And I will spend a couple of slides on that. Mm. This picture I, I got from Irene Valenzuela. Um, <clears throat> here's the landscape, which are many solutions with uh, many minima and so on, with different calabiales and different fluxes and so on. But then there may be other theories which are outside here for which there's no proper string theory realization of them. And that's called the, the song that, that came out from uh, Kumran Vafa uh, 15 years ago or so. Uh, <clears throat> it has been an active subject of research in the last uh, few years also. <clears throat> the question, is, which I think is, is very good, is the following. Uh, so many people, after realizing that string theory is so rich, but also complicated, they say, well, let's forget about string theory. Let's concentrate only on effective field theories. Um, I'm very smart, so I will be able to find some, solve some good problems on physics. And I don't care about this ultraviolet completion because uh, at some point it will fit into a, a string theory or anything else because there are so many solutions. Uh, so, and that's an, an attitude that people can take during effective field theories, which is perfectly valid. Uh, but uh, it will diminish the importance of a string theory to address many questions because essentially everything can be done just effectively theory. What Kuhn et al. have uh, pointed out is I said, well, it's not every single effective theory you can think of can be also up, uh, 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 lifted to, to a proper vacuum in uh, quantum gravity, in particular string theory. So, and there are examples for that. Uh, so, and, and so all the theories that cannot be uh, generalized or, to, to, or completed in the ultraviolet, uh, this is called the swamp length. So we can separate the landscape, which is huge, and the swamp length that may be even bigger because there are many more inconsistent theories or consistent theories out there. So, <clears throat> and the question is how to identify this swamp length such that we can then get better and better con uh, control on what the landscape is. Okay, so that's, that's the picture. Okay. So, uh, so there are several conjectures. Um, uh, so as I said, it's, it's quantum gravity versus effective field theory in the sense that uh, not all effective field theories can be generalized to quantum gravity. <clears throat> the prime example of that is what is called the weak gravity conjecture, <clears throat> which essentially came out also from paper of Kumrum with other people um, uh, many years ago already. Um, which is saying that there are many arguments, many indications that gravity is the weakest force. If there's another force, which is a, say, gauge uh, force or something, the corresponding um, charges are bound such that that force is, is, doesn't beat gravity. And then all the examples people know fit with that, and there are very, very general arguments to trust that's the case. <clears throat> this also called something called a distance conjecture. Um, for which this, at some point you're saying you move in the modelized space to different um, um, <clears throat> values of, of a field. At some point you will get in a, in, in, in a distance from one to the other one can be big enough that you can start getting a, a tower of a massive states becoming light. Uh, and that happens in many cases and so on. Uh, for a review of all this, uh, there's a nice review of uh, Aaron Palti in that last year, uh, which I think is, 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 uh, summarizes everything else. The, the, <clears throat> the one that I will mention here, which is, touches the landscape directly, is that it's called the, uh, the Sitter conjecture. Uh, and I call anti here, uh, just to say that it's, it's against the Sitter, no, it's not that it's anti the Sitter, um, in the sense that claiming that the, the, you can have any potential, but the derivative of the potential divided by the potential itself has to be bigger than something. And uh, if that is the case, then the derivative cannot be zero, and then you, you don't have a minimum. So that's the conjecture, it emphasizes conjecture. And the argument for that, <clears throat> it was only based in the sense that, essentially it's coming back to the dying cyber problem. Uh, the dying cyber said, well, the only reg region that we can fully trust is the runaway behavior. So, so there may be that all these attempts, like a KKLT or large volume or so, um, <clears throat> are, will bring you in a region that, I mean, the, the, even though the volume is large or the, the, the coupling is weak, is not under full control. So we cannot 
be 100% sure that there is, you have a very well-defined theory that, that a person, you have a perturbative expansion, a person terminal can have a huge coefficient that will make them not uh, uh, appropriate. So, <clears throat> and, and then there are other, other conjectures called transplant and conjecture that he, uh, again, Kronberg came out uh, recently about saying that you can, if there are most being below the Planck length and the early universe, they should not have an impact. Uh, today, so if one says that, that's okay. So, uh, for the one that worries also here is the the sitter conjecture, <clears throat> and getting the sitter in general has many challenges. Define what an S matrix is because you don't have asymptotically flat spaces like in Minkowski, so you, you cannot define an S matrix properly. So, if the idea is if, if the sitter can be seen as a resonance, there are classical no go theorems uh, like a uh, famous Maldacena Nunez and, uh, and Gary Gibbons, and so people tried to get the sitter from, from supergravity solutions and they, they didn't find. Although I, I always remind that, you know, of course, a classical argument doesn't kill anything because yeah, the atoms are, themselves are unstable classically. So, but it's, it's also good it's just to show that how difficult it is. And, uh, <clears throat> and as I said before, no the sitter solutions of a string theory are under full calculation and control, like KKLT and large volume and so on. And there have been, challenges to this scenario, KKLT and large volume. Uh, one point by SETI uh, saying that the fluxes are not under full control in, unless you have supersymmetric 10 dimensional cases. Uh, then people claim, claim that the tuning of the W0 to be very small in KKLT is, is, is not uh, well justified because after all W0 is determined by integers and you have to have combinations of many integers to give you something which is 10 to the minus six or so. That, that that will be very strange. So that's a criticism. For the large volume itself, um, <clears throat> uh, this uh, remember that the large volume scenario comes because there are perturbative corrections to the Keller potential. And the question is, are there uh, other perturbative corrections that people have not computed that can dominate over the ones that we were using in the large volume scenario? And if that is the case, these corrections may change the structure or, 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 or eliminate the minima that, that we have found. And, <clears throat> and the anti-brains, for instance, have been very much criticized uh, because there can be a singularity in, in, in the, the tip of the throat that you have the anti-brains. They're non supersymmetric so it's not easy to control your effective theory. People say they put them by hand and so on. So there are a series of papers of people uh, <clears throat> in these collaborations, uh, Mariana Grania in collaboration, Benner and Riet and so on. Uh, and then uh, more recently, there's a uh, trying to understand non perturbative effects from 10 dimensions um, by Moritz et al. And it has been an answer from Heberker and Kashi et al. And so that they actually, they actually fit very well with the KKLT. So in that sense, this is not the real issue now, <clears throat> as far as I know. And uh, so, it's, it's good to keep an eye of our, all these criticisms. Most of them have already been addressed. I have, say, I have to say that over the last 15 years, we have been challenged very often about new corrections that can change the large volume scenario. So, and so far, uh, all the corrections that have been computed are actually subdominant or can be uh, absorbed by field definitions. Uh, but there's one potential source that we have to, to, to consider and we are working on that at the moment. So I think this is an active area. Or it says the same thing of constructed models with W0 much smaller than one, and so on. <clears throat> but there have been many achievements, as I told you. This is remarkable that to get that, we use all the ingredients that we have at hand, as you know, brains, orientative force, warping, perturbative effects, number two effects, and so on. Uh, some people see this positive, and some people see this negative. Uh, so, so the negative way is that people say, oh, it's too complicated, and then I, I better don't know. It's too, 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 too hard to have control. Uh, on the other hand, I think simplicity is, is something of the past. I think uh, arguments of simplicity, you say, I mean, the simplest compatibilization is the torus that give you non chiral mitre, is totally rule out, and so on. And so at some point, you have to, to address um, less and less simple scenarios. And it, it, so you have to address the sense of the most general thing available. That's what we have been doing for the past <clears throat> 15 years or so. Um, and anyway, so uh, so some of the success, uh, so many successes have been happening, in particular also getting um, 
uh, Hayer Kissing Scales, dealing with the anti-brain in terms of an effective criteria, the nice work of Kalash et al. using nil potent superfields, and so on. So there has been a lot of progress, and people have been, it's an active field. So it's still, the last word is not yet done, but I think it's, it's part of this scientific activities that uh, uh, that always we always make uh, small steps uh, every once in a while, and then the picture gets better and better understood. So there's much to be done here. <clears throat> okay, I will take a quick detour, and uh, I, I'm losing my voice also. <clears throat> and as I told you, I'm half my way. So from now on, I will try to be uh, faster, you don't mind, I will skip some slides, just to get the point. So this is what uh, Sayantan was saying before, the back vacuum transition. So this is a more important part, and that's something I've been working uh, in the past. Uh, so it's a concrete physical process where quantum aspects of gravity are crucial. And calculation tools have been developed over the last three years or so. So <clears throat> I can only see the black holes, when now all this effort doing studying information in black holes and so on, is, is the other uh, case where you can use gravity with some quantum aspects to understand uh, some uh, uh, concrete physical phenomenon for you. We, you cannot neglect uh, gravity. <laughs> It's very important because it may be the origin and the end of our universe. So, as I told you, you know, in this picture of the multiverse, you have to vacuum decay. So our our own universe can be this the, the result of a decay of a previous universe. So we happen to be one of these bubbles that is expanding because it came coming from a higher cosmological constant universe and so on. And but also we ourselves, at some point, uh, our uh, universe can also decay to another universe and so on. Uh, Furthermore, also even in the Higgs case, look at this is a famous picture of the Higgs particle, nothing, no string theory or something on the Higgs with uh, looking uh, with, with the corrections and using the, the, the bounce on the Higgs mass on the top. We live in a very, very, very particular point that uh, the metastability where you can actually be subject to, to decay and eventually uh, our whole universe decay. So in that sense, it's important to study vacuum decay. And I think it's important to study the population of the landscape. <clears throat> These vacuum transitions were studied in the 1970s, mostly by Sidney Coleman, which is a beautiful set of papers, he and several collaborations, uh, doing it first uh, in field theory, taking the WKB approximation that people use in quantum mechanics to expand it to field theory and then to gravity. And the manifestation is that at some point you start, you can see uh, theory with two different vacua, and then the question is how you can go from one uh, vacuum to another one. And at some point you create a bubble of the, of, of, of the, say the true vacuum inside the background of a false vacuum. So this <clears> is <throat> the Coleman de Lucia. Exactly, yes. Coleman started, well, first it was Coleman himself, then Coleman Callan, and then uh, for field theory, and then Coleman de Lucia for gravity, yes. And I recommend those papers, which are a beautiful piece of work. <clears throat> Very good. And uh, so the decay rate, as is, is, is they use a Euclidean approach in terms of an instanton solution. And uh, these are the main, main names, Coleman de Lucia. Then Lee and Weinberg just pointed out that the Coleman de Lucia with gravity can give you also a solution that you can also tunnel from the smaller cosmological constant to a higher cosmological constant. And Brown, Tatelman did it uh, in the way that we care about the strings, which is going from one land, uh, one uh, the sitter to another the sitter without following the shape of the potential in the middle. And um, so these are all done late, late 70s and 80s. <clears throat> so the important quantity to the computer is the K rate, gamma, is e to the minus b, where b is the action of the, of the instanton solution, which is just uh, 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 yes, you have to go to Euclidean approach, turn the potential around, and look for, for a, 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 a what is called a bounce solution. And uh, so the B is the difference between the action for the instanton minus the background. And people computed the B and it's giving you, it has this uh, expression for two different decitors, H0 and H, uh, HO and HI are uh, the outside and inside value of the cosmological constant. So H squared is lambda, this is a cosmological constant <clears throat> or, or the Hubble parameter. Say. For that, so you can you have a concrete calculation and then, uh, then yeah, once you have it to it B, you have it to the minus B, and you can see it's exponentially suppressed. It's a number two. And in the string landscape, I said there are two types of those. I can see a potential, as I told you, 
one minimum to another minimum for which you don't have a potential, a, 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 a barrier in between. But also, given a minimum, there is a barrier from this minimum to the decompactification minimum for which we know the potential. Okay, so in, in, to be concrete, th this part of the potential will be like a volume uh, potential. Uh, and this part, it will be for the complex structure for which we know only the minimum, but we don't know if there is any, any connection between, for instance, between this minimum and this minimum. We don't see, there's no barrier that we can just picture, but you know that there is one minimum to another minimum. Whereas from here to here, there is a, the barrier is very well defined. Okay, so there are two transitions, and you can compute then the, the amplitude for both. And the first thing you find is that the transition to the compactification is dominant over the transition from one minimum to another minimum. In the large volume scenario, for instance, it goes like e to the minus volume square times that. So in principle, you would say, oh, it's preferred to go to the 10 dimensions that, rather than to go to another minimum, uh, uh, to another decision minimum. So that, that's, uh, but uh, yes, but naively, I thought that that was enough. It's well, both probabilities are very small. At some point, it will happen. <clears throat> However, uh, there's this paper with Aguirre, Johnson, and Larfors in the 2010 and 9, where they have a com considered, in particular, a toy model, which is very explicit, uh, for which you have these two minima. This will be one decitter, another decitter, but each of them ha can have a barrier towards decompactification. So they say, well, following the same procedure that Coleman et al. consider, they found no solutions that go from one decitter to another decitter. So they call it an obstacle to populate in the landscape because then you cannot go from one decitter to another decitter that Wusu Polchinski were claiming. <clears throat> we in science, we think that this cannot be the case because as any quantum effect should be possible, but it's a challenge how to do it. Uh, and, and they raise a very interesting question, I think. Um, so that's one of the motivations for us working on that. And that's, the the work that I will summarize in a few slides now is is, is based <clears throat> is is work by Fischler, Morgan, and Polchinski in 1990, trying to follow the work of, uh, in particular, the work of Guth, Farhi, and Guven, uh, in the same around the same time, where Guth et al. they were doing the following. <clears throat> So, so essentially, to follow, uh, I told you that Coleman and De Lucia use a Euclidean approach. So uh, Fischler et al, they, they use a Hamiltonian approach, which is directly Lorentzian. And uh, it's, better, it's good to understand Tony and gravity, just to understand Coleman and De Lucia from another perspective. But also to address this question, which is very good and given uh, posed in the 1990, which is, is it possible to optonal, say from Minkowski to the sitter, and that is a very interesting question. They call it that the title of the paper is can, can you create a universe from the lab? Essentially, because in the lab we are in Mikoski, so can you create something that they sit and then let the, 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 the volume evolve, the, the universe evolve and so on. And uh, so Coleman had told us how to go from one decitter to another decitter. Uh, Lee and Weinberg told us how to go from low decitter to a higher decitter. But in their approach, going from Minkowski to the decitter was not allowed. However, Fari et al., Fari Guten Gowen, found a way to go from, the, from Minkowski to the sitter. <clears throat> and that's important also to address this issue that I mentioned before about the, the obstacle to populate the landscape. Because uh, imagine here in this picture, imagine so, oh, we cannot go from here to there, because we, whenever we try to go from here to there, we end, we end up in Minkowski. But if we can go back from Minkowski to the sitter, then there's no issue. You can also populate the, the landscape. So, so in that sense, that's a, of course, this is a cartoon because the, the Minkowski piece on the right is Minkowski in 10 dimensions. But I think from the effective theory point of view, that's, that's an interesting, interesting chart. Okay, so we revised this, uh, 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 this uh, approach of uh, Fischler et al. And uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, I can see I'm running totally out of time. So. I will just come out to the to the conclusions uh, to the to the to the to their final result. But they start with the standard Hamiltonian approach with the labs and 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 shift functions, uh, the metric in terms of uh, spherical symmetric metric, 
as a function of t and r, the radius of the two spheres, and t the time. And then if I have an action, which has a bulk action and a, a wall action. Wall means because is is the wall is 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 the wall of, of the bubble that is created. So that you have to do the matching between the two metrics in in the in in, in the surface and on the wall. <coughs> plus matter fields and so on, where the simplest case they consider is where instead of considering a scalar field with the potential, they just consider the, the, the energy density to be um, the cosmological constant, say lambda outside times a, 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 a theta function, just a step function, and lambda inside times another step function. So, in, so essentially it's like a bubble, inside has a cosmological constant, outside has another one. And there's no scalar field or anything to, to go between that. So just to, to address the, the, the basic question. <clears throat> so the Hamiltonian approach, you can have you can define the corresponding momenta, the the, the Hamiltonian, the, the, the constraints, each of them have to be zero to follow the, the Dirac condensation procedure. And uh, and at the end, uh, this reduces the question to the following, which I find very interesting. It reduces to R hat is the is the position of the of the of the wall. So the derivative with respect to time plus v, which is a, is a function of, of itself of, the, of, this, of this r hat, uh, is equal to minus one. So that uh, looks like a potential uh, in quantum mechanics where you have a, a kinetic energy plus a potential equals to minus one. So you have an energy equals to minus one here, and uh, then the, the variable here in this case is the is the radius of the bubble. So you can have here a bubble that starts with zero radius. Uh, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and at some point gets a turning point and comes back. Or you can have a big bubble that comes, that gets smaller and smaller and smaller, gets a turning point and comes back. And in quantum mechanics, of course, you can start this bubble and at some point tunnel through the other bubble. So that's that's that, that, that's that's a, a possibility. So <clears throat> we can express this in terms of um, of uh, like, like this picture of a strategy that's a. Uh, 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 you can have this region here and the region there, and then eventually, eventually tunneling. Each in terms of, um, you can put that in terms of uh, um, space time diagrams. So you can have, <clears throat> if you want to consider the, the, the transition from, say, Minkowski to the sitter, the general solution in, in Minkowski, which has a spherical symmetry, which is the, is the Schwarzschild solution. So you can start with Schwarzschild solution to the sitter. So that's why you have, a, uh, and then here, uh, why should I have a, here? Then you see on the right hand side, you have the Schwarzschild uh, space time. The, this blue is the trajectory of the bubble. You start with radius zero, goes, and come back to zero. This is the point A. And this is the other one. We start at infinity and come back at infinity. This is the point B. And, and so, whereas on the left hand side, it is the, the the, the the diagram of of uh, of uh, the sitter space time. So at some point you have the bubble that separates Minkowski, Schwarzschild, so and the sitter. So the, the so the, at the end, so that then you can see how how the question is how you can go from here to there. So how you can combine these two space times and. Uh, Again, you, you follow a Hamiltonian approach. So you, you, you promote you now the Hamiltonian constraint to a quantum mechanics equation, like a Schrodinger equation. And it happens to be, it's called the Willard with equation, which is the time independent Schrodinger equation in super space where psi is the wave function. So h psi equal to zero, that's the. <clears throat> and then using the WKB approximation, psi will be a, a if sum of two exponentials, but i is the i, I times the action, and from that compute the transition probabilities, the ratio of probabilities of psi in the uh, the new solution, the, so, which is the sitter flat and the bubble, so and divided by the background, so which is the background is just is just a flat space time, and uh, so then the probability is identified with the decay rate. You can compute the decay rate as ratios of two probabilities, and then doing that, you recover uh, the Coleman, sort of the Farhi, Good, and Guven solution. I will skip the details uh, because uh, I think I'm running too much out of time. Uh, but uh, but just to I just uh, invite you to see our papers and, and the 
uh, uh, Pichler Morgan Polchinski paper. Uh, so at the end, you get exactly this solution. This is what I was telling you. In the case you want to go from the sitter to the sitter, you get the same solution that Coleman and Andalucci had found. But when you take the limit of one of the cosmologies constant to zero, that will have given you zero in Coleman and Andalucci, but in, in the um, Fari Gulen Wilthor of, uh, of uh, Fischler et al., you get something non zero. And the background is given, given here uh, in this case by it's, it's, uh, uh, the outside uh, Hubble constant <coughs> parameter. And uh, there is an eta factor outside, which can be plus or minus one. And it so happens that uh, the background will be just the probability of creating just one, say, the sitter space out of nothing. And that's precisely the, the, what uh, that reproduces what, the, what is called the Hartle Hawking wave function uh, for eta plus one, and for eta equals to minus one, that's the Belenkin wave function. So, in some sense, this is incorporated already into this, uh, this approach, which is nice. And <clears throat> if you have the, you take the positive sign, you get the tail balance in some sense that the, the probability of going up is equal to the probability of going down times the exponential of the difference between the entropies. That's precisely the, the, the statement of what the tail balance, you can go from higher to smaller and from smaller to higher, to smaller to constant. And for, well, from the sitter to Minkowski, uh, going down is okay, but going up, you cannot get it by just uh, going from the sitter, uh, using this limit of the sitter to zero, but you can do it by getting Schwarzschild to the sitter. And the picture here is very nice. This two stage that I told you of going, the small bubble growing and then uh, tunneling and then uh, uh, going to, to, to expanding, uh, creating a expanding universe after that. Here you can see in this region, this was the trajectory of the bubble. You start with R equal to zero, go, and then at some point there is this, um, a wormhole, pass through the wormhole in the standard Schwarzschild diagram, and then go there. And this wormhole is what is being imp uh, implemented by the quantum transition here. And then you can go from a zero bubble size to a growing up to, well, to infinity bubble size, and, and through this quantum transition that is passing through the wormhole in Schwarzschild, which is very nice. And then you do that. Uh, this is the picture that uh, Alan Guth usually a picture about how you can create this child universe in terms of the, of the, of the transition from uh, Minkowski to the sitter. And, <clears throat> and then take the value, the, the limit of mass equal to zero, Schwarzschild, that will give you flat uh, uh, Minkowski, and you get a, a non-zero probability. So that means that it is possible to go from Minkowski to the sitter. This has been very much, uh, well, uh, then we can generalize it for, for uh, uh, many cases, and here we have a plot of different possibility of going from one decitor to another decitor, from Minkowski to the decitor, and decitor to Minkowski, and uh, going to the decitor is more complicated because uh, uh, Coleman de Lucia tells you that uh, going from anti decitor essentially you, you get up to a big, big crunch. But uh, essentially you can compute the probabilities of each of these things happening and the relative probabilities of what, how you get. And the, the interesting thing is that, so you have a non-zero probability of going from Minkowski to the decitor, and it has been very much criticized by many people. Uh, First of all, in the Euclidean versus Lorentzian, in the Euclidean approach, <coughs> this is a funny Guven and Guth uh, instanton happens to be singular. So you say, well, there is something wrong if there is having singularity there. And, uh, but in the Hamiltonian approach, there is no singularity and you, you reproduce the same result. So in that sense, the, 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 there is no criticism of that. Then you, have, you can question what it, the validity of the Hamiltonian approach, but it's, 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 it's well defined. Um, <coughs> There is another issue, and this is, uh, uh, I would like to emphasize because it's very <clears throat> popular. The reason people have argued in the last, say, 10, 15 years against this possibility of going Minkowski to the sitter is by, based on a very nice paper of Revogel, Hubeni, Maloney, Myers, Rangamani, and Schenker, where they say that uh, essentially uh, going from, from Minkowski to the sitter will be equivalent to, say, that you evolve a pure state into a mixed state. It's like a losing information in a black hole. However, reconsideration of that tells you that you don't lose. Uh, you, you go from a pure state to another pure state, and there's no loss of, no, no issue about loss of information. So, um, and, and, so and then there are other issues that are, that are, that are, that are I prefer. Now at this stage, I will skip. So, <clears throat> to finish this part of the, of, of, um, of the um, transitions, 
this is something that I'm working at the moment, so I would like just to mention very briefly. Uh, Coleman de Luce, when they found the instanton, the instanton they imposed to have an O4 symmetry. So you can have a metric here. That, so the O4 symmetry comes because the scalar field will depend only on this combination x squared plus tau squared, but x tau is the Euclidean time. So this is a, a spherical symmetry here for four coordinates. And then they, they impose, not derive, the metric to have the similar symmetry. From that, they compute the, the standard trick in Euclidean, go opposite, uh, turn the, the, uh, around the, the potential, and look for, a, a, um, for this bound solution. Like you can go on one minimum, say, <coughs> minimum here to another minimum and come back. Uh, <coughs> and then from that, they, after that, they go back to, to Lorentzian signature, doing several. Um, 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 what's called uh, this, um, analytic continuations. And then what you get happens to be, uh, now Xi will be playing the role of time, say. Um, so you get a open universe. Remember the my second slide, you have k equals zero, one or minus one, they get a k equals to minus one. You know, so people have used this result as, as claiming that one general model independent prediction of the landscape is that at the end, you end up with an open universe in, 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 your, uh, uh, in, the, in the universe and the bubble that you're expanding. <clears throat> so, however, we follow a Lorentzian approach, even with the potential as they did. We had to use mean and superspace approximation, just one single variable to, 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 to be able to do the calculations. So you consider A and, and the potential phi and go to the single approximation, which is they, they also do. We got the same result again, it's called Mandeluche, but we started the Minkowski and then and we didn't have to do any analytic continuation. And what we get is you start with a spherical symmetric, you end up with a spherical symmetric solution again. So what we get is the same transition rate, but the end result is, is a uh, <clears throat> closed universe. This corresponds to k equals to plus one universe. And, uh, and that, that I, I find that very intriguing. So we went back to check in the case of uh, Fischler et al. in their particular case, which is no potential, just two cosmological constants. And you can also see that you have the SO3 symmetry of, um, of, 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 of the spherical symmetry and not, a, so, no, not the O3,1 that uh, Coleman de Luce assumed after doing the analytic implementation of O4. So, in that sense, that's a major difference between the Hamiltonian and the Euclidean approach, uh, which uh, I think uh, you know we are elaborating now, which I think is very interesting. Um, so it looks from our perspective from the, that that now instead of landscape implying open universes, the landscape seems to imply a closed universe, which is exactly the opposite. And then using the current fashion, we can just say, well, maybe the open universes are in the sunlight. So we can talk about the sunlight. And then the question is, does it have any observational implications? Well, I told you at the beginning that inflation essentially washes out all the, 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 the presence of curvature at the beginning because of this uh, dilution, the fa factor k or a square was smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, but still, depending on the number of it falls, so you may have some implications at the, uh, that can be observational. But also as a question of um, conceptually, you know, if our universe is closed or open, it's a very big difference. If it is closed, that means that essentially the volume is finite, the number, the amount of matter is finite, uh, the energy is finite, or zero. So, so in that sense, it's, it's a big uh, difference to determine if we live in open or closed universe, and so this is worth uh, exploring. And uh, <clears throat> So there's a nice paper of Frivogel, Soska, et al. Uh, exploring the case of open universe from the landscape because that, that was uh, correctly following Coleman de Lucha, they, they, they assumed that it was open. So we have been following the same approach using a closed universe and that there's, uh, there are several interesting implications. Okay, so this is the end of the vacuum decay, the two. And uh, then, uh, and now time is an issue. I already talked about pre I would suggest uh, you uh, go through uh, because this is very important. Okay, so I'll try. Okay, so 
Okay, so now I, I did the before inflation part. Now, now we'll do string inflation in a few slides and then after inflation. So string inflation. <clears throat> so there's several, so now that we have a uh, model stabilization, we can just um, uh, ask the question if we can have those potentials if we can get inflation to work. And uh, so uh, one picture, again, I took it from my Scientific American article, uh, you can say, well, let's take a modular inflation. So it's, it's like one of these cycles start a given size, so while it is stabilized to the minimum size, while it, this is happening, uh, the the scale factor in one of the brains uh, or in any brain starts increasing, and that gives you inflation. So the picture of here is that you start with the volume model uh, with the modulus in this way, then you get to towards this minimum, and while this happens, then you get inflation in in the, in the in our space time. <clears throat> For that, there are several kinds of modular, which are, uh, I will not go into details. It can be the overall volume. It can be what called blow up mode, which is the size of this uh, Swiss cheese holes. So, so, or it can be a fiber model that I was telling you before. And uh, in this case, the fiber, you get a potential like this. And the potential looks very much like the uh, Starobinsky potential. So in that sense, it gives you inflation in a natural way. Another possibility, again, taken from the, uh, this, um, a scientific American article is that, is that there are two brains that can collide to each other. So the separation of the brains give you a, a field that is, and that could be the inflaton. And that uh, has been explored by, by, by many people also later on. <clears throat> and there are several scenarios that which we summarize here in a paper with uh, Cliff Burgess and Michele Ciccoli in 2013. Um, something called brain anti brain inflation, Wilson inflation, DBI inflation, which was very, very popular also. And axiom monodromy has been very, very, very popular in the last few, but also some of the ones, the ones that we propose, carrier inflation, fiber inflation, and so on. For that, we predicted, uh, we can, uh, uh, wrote the value of the <coughs> tilt and the spectral index, and S, and the tensor to scalar ratio, with different values uh, uh, of that, that can be a prediction. And, uh, and then just compare with Planck, and they all fit very well with Planck. But, uh, if imagined that uh, I'll probably you may not remember, or you were not uh, <clears throat> doing physics at the time, a few years ago, uh, four or five years ago, BICEP came up with this announcement, which is a spectacular announcement, saying that they had discovered tensor modes with R very large, so I don't know, 0.01 or something. <clears throat> so that was a major, major claim. And if that result would have been true, Essentially, every single model of inflation coming from strings will have been ruled out, with the sole exception of this axiom monodromy that predict R relatively larger than all the other ones. Uh, fiber inflation predicts 7 and 10 to the minus 3 is large, but not as large as Bicep had predicted. Uh, but so only this one will have survived. So that I always give us an argument that you know there is there's some predictability within string theory you are humble enough to concentrate on particular scenarios and not on the theory itself um, <clears throat> in general. And this, this would have been a good example of that. Uh, and also, I also tested myself because I was very, very, very excited with the, with the uh, uh, bicep uh, result came out. I came home and told my wife, you know, this is a major result in physics. I'm so happy. And she told me, well, what about your models? And I told her, all of them rule out. <laughs> So she said, so why are you so happy? <laughs> so in that sense, I tested that I didn't care that much about my models, but, but it's good to, if, if it, was, it was true. Unfortunately, the result was not true and then it, it disappeared, but that, that, that's still we are holding our breath for the future because then a model like fiber inflation, for instance, can fit very well. Look, at, uh, here is another picture. Fiber inflation is very similar to Starobinsky, but it gives you different prediction for, for, for the, ratio, the ratio between R and NS compared to Swarovinsky. So in that sense, it, uh, with the difference that this is stringy and this is not stringy. So you, you, we can also uh, compare. But also there are models of inflation for which, like a scale blow up inflation, for which R is essentially zero and it will never be able to, to see it. So that's for people who claim that inflation, you don't see R, you rule out inflation is not correct, of course, because you can find models of inflation that give you R very, very small. <clears throat> okay, so now post-inflation. The most important thing we can say about after inflation is, imagine you have all these moduli. One of them can be the inflaton, but there are many other ones. And uh, so while the junior is inflating, this model will be fit, any of these models can be fitting, sitting in some place, which is not the final minimum. 
after the other the, the inflation finishes, then this field starts oscillating around their own minimum, and and at the end they stabilize. While they do that, it is at that time what reheating happens. It's not at the end of inflation the reheating happens. It's only after the last modulus that you are stabilizing its minimum uh, 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 does the reheating that that, that 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 reheating happens. So it changes completely the picture of inflation. <coughs> And this is after inflation because then there's a, a big a period where the, do, the the dominant source of the energy density is this oscillation of the of this moduli around the minima. They can overclose the universe <coughs> or or even room uh, uh, nucleosynthesis unless the the mass of this moduli is 30 TeV or more. So that puts a bound, cosmological bound, on how heavy these uh, fields are, and the, this is interesting because the mass of the moduli is similar to the mass of the gravitino, sometimes it's smaller, but very, most of them are the same mass. So essentially, a string theory was telling us since the beginning that if you have moduli heavier, uh, lighter than, than the one TeV that will be good for, 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 for the LEC energies, uh, then it will be a problem for cosmology. Now, we say, well, they can be heavier, that's not a problem. And so that tells you that it changes the history of the universe. So after inflation, you have this new period of moduli domination. And they have several implications, like I said, modifying the number of foldings after inflation and so on, that I will try. So just to give you a close uh, a picture, this something from, I got from Scott Watson, that, uh, the standard picture that, that <clears throat> you have the plan scale, you have inflation, and then, then you have a, a, a radiation domination, and then, then so on. Here you have, you have Planck scale, you have inflation, and then you have this period, which is a uh, moduli domination. And then you can have uh, uh, back uh, re uh, radiation domination and amalgam domination later on. So that sends the history of the universe changes. And during uh, the, the decay of one of these moduli, it can, for instance, the decay, the volume modulus can decay into this uh, its action because they couple. And this action is dark radiation. So you have to see what dark radiation you get. It's not that you can come up with an idea of what the radiation is. It comes out naturally from the structure of the theory. So you have to be careful not to be, uh, that this dark radiation doesn't uh, uh, ruin your experiments. So you have to have some constraints given on what is the reheating temperature and so on. And uh, <clears throat> okay, so that's the constraints on dark radiation. And then the, the last um, stringy part I wanted to say is, is this oscillons part from string modulus. So oscillons are, once you start oscillating around the minimum, uh, you can produce localized, long-lived, non-linear excitations of the scalar fields. And these are uh, what people call oscillons. And they can play a role, in particular, they can produce gravitational waves and so on. And so this is a paper I wrote a, a couple of years ago. By the way, uh, science and this, I started working on this because of the conference we worked together in Calcutta a few years ago. So I met uh, Stefan Antush and we started working on this. So that was a nice conference. Uh, <clears throat> and. Uh, so the idea is that, uh, of course, you start um, at some point uh, going, to, going towards the minimum, and depending on how these oscillations go, you pass through the inflection point and so on, and then you have a period where you can have other parametric resonance or what is called tachyonic preheating, and in both of them, you can produce these inhomogeneities of the, of, of the field, and that those are the oscillations. So the conditions you need is that um, quantum fluctuations, that, that allows you to, to, for the field to grow as oscillates, but also an attractive interaction. So for instance, you have a quartic interaction. This has to be a minus sign here uh, to have an attractive force to, to allow them to, 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 get, uh, uh, to attract each other and uh, to, to, to get to an attractive point and then get, get the minimum. So we studied this in the potential we have studied in terms of KKLT and the large volume. So I can just show you that there are also where they produce gravitational waves Maybe just show you a nice pictures here. Here on the um, right hand, on the left hand side is a, the large volume scenario with the, one of these blow up modes. On the right hand side is the KKLT, and you can see all these inhomogeneities being produced, and they are uh, these oscillons. And you can see they are not spherically symmetric, so they produce gravitational waves naturally, and eventually can be uh, put onto test. So there's a, a, uh, another. Uh, <coughs> a picture of the same thing, then you can see the spectrum of gravitational waves and compute the value, I'm sorry, of the frequencies, which is on the right side, on the heavy, uh, uh, large size, 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 9 hertz. 
So with the energy density of the order 10 to the minus 10. So this is far beyond the LIGO. And, and, and so it's not observable most probably by LIGO unless you do some tuning. Um, so, but that will, and then we added to this the effect of gravity because that all the um, simulations were done without gravity, but you have gravity, then it's an extra attractive force that, that affects not only the production, but also the evolution of all the, of this uh, inhomogeneities. And this is what people call boson stars. And then you can ask, <clears throat> you can have boson stars within string theory. And uh, so again, I will skip some of the slides. Uh, depending on the scalar field that you have, if it is complex or real, without gravity is something called cue balls that again, uh, Coleman introduced, or oscillons if it is a real field. And if you have gravity, you can have what people used to call boson stars and mini boson stars. Uh, these are the most generic, I would say, because the mass of the star is uh, lighter than this one, but it's this, for this one, you need some tuning of the string of the couplings, this is natural thing or something called oscillatons. And this is all what we call modulized stars in the sense that it's gravity that's playing some role. <clears throat> and uh, I will skip some of the slides again because of the time. Let me try to, to um, summarize. So you have interesting thing, you have modulized star, depending on the modulus, you have uh, the mass of the particle, but you have the start, the mass of the corresponding star. <laughs> And the radius of the corresponding star and some has been factor for 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 for, for the uh, uh, energy they produce and uh, <clears throat> it's interesting that the mass of the star usually is inversely proportional to the mass of the particle and nice thing that uh, since we parameterize everything by the volume these were inverse powers of the volume these are positive powers of the volume and and then you can see uh, uh, and the radius of the corresponding star also depends on that so in that sense you can give a picture and if you have this big range of radia a mass of particles, just starting from very microscopic things and dense to very macroscopic things like this, uh, the corresponding star coming out of the, this volume action. I told you that this exponential is light and the mass of the corresponding star is exponentially heavy. It can be observable today. Uh, we studied evolution using this uh, GR Chumba, which is a, a code that people have been implemented here in Cambridge. Uh, to, to do numerical relativity and for different types of potential models and the typical that uh, of this model like this is for instance this is like the fiber model so on but this is you use the the the, the names given by uh, this alpha tractors uh, uh, people and then you can found we found that the corresponding homogeneities are either metastable they disperse they produce something but then disperse or they collapse into black holes um, and in principle so this is the picture one that is collapsed into a black hole. So in principle, these are all, to start with, spherical symmetric, but there will be any coupling or something that will make it non-spherical symmetric and they, will, can, they can produce uh, gravitational waves that can be detected. And again, the gravitational waves will always be um, in the range that I told you, very, very, very high frequencies. And uh, so you can see this uh, uh, high density collapse to a black hole. <clears throat> so the last part of my, long talk already, is high frequency gravitational waves. So motivated by the fact that we had these high frequencies, then we say, well, what about searching for them? And uh, we start asking the experts, and very few people have been working on that. And uh, this, I, th I think, is, is very important because uh, if, if you see the electromagnetic spectrum for every single range of frequencies. People have found different physical uh, uh, mechanisms or physical things observable. Uh, whereas for gravitational waves, we are in the LIGO region and we are exploring, we're going to explore the lesser region or something below, smaller or smaller or smaller gravitational waves, but not, there's not a strong proposal for something moving beyond the kilohertz uh, frequencies. Um, that, that is what the, the case that we, we are interested in. So we organized a conference a workshop last year in Trieste, when I was still in Trieste, uh, together <clears throat> with uh, Francesco Muglia and Valerie Domke and others. Uh, and uh, and essentially, uh, we call the few people that we knew were interested or have thought about that theories and experimentals. The stringy, most probably, most people were not a stringy, of course. And uh, to explore that, so there is a challenge already because the energy density uh, for say fixed energy density, the the then h, which is a measure, is like the delta l or l that people uh, measure in in, the, in, in LIGO or so. Uh, 
is, is they're related by the frequency. So the higher the frequency, the, the, for a given uh, energy density, you need a much more H, so much more L delta L over L. So the precision you need already for this is far better than people have in LIGO at the moment. So that's it's a big challenge. But the motivation is interesting because it is essentially all essentially all the sources of uh, high frequency gravitational waves. We can we listed them here. Yes, textures, metastable strings, phase transitions in the early universe, cosmic strings, oscillons, preheating, etc., inflation, and so uh, <clears throat> They all produce this uh, uh, high frequency gravitational waves. And essentially, there's no competition. There's, they're all, these are stochastic gravitational waves, it's not coherent. And, uh, and at these frequencies, you see something at those frequencies, then you will be seeing something cosmological, a stringy or not. So, in that sense, it's, it's a very compelling argument. To people to proceed and to to to, to study the possibility of uh, looking for detectors of gravitational waves. <clears throat> okay, this is the end of my talk. So it was uh, longer than probably you all expected. Uh, so I, I hope to have conveyed the message that string cosmology is a very exciting field. There are many things to be done uh, before, during, and after inflation. The landscape it uh, comes out as a very important part of this, and uh, it's a very it's a controversial but a very rich and interesting physics there. Vacuum transitions play an important role. They can help us to populate the landscape, but also give us an idea if the universe is open or closed. There are concrete models of string inflation, some of them, and, and, and they can be ruled out depending on, on, on uh, if they discover tensor to scalar ratios and so on. It's a very rich physics after inflation. And the, the domination of, of moduli, moduli domination also, I have to say, reheating, dark radiation, biogenesis, oscillons, moduli stars, etc. And the fact that you can search high frequency gravitational waves in the future, that would be very exciting. Um, <clears throat> essentially, most of the sources are all cosmological. And for strings, imagine people will start detecting these gravitational waves in the far future, especially. Then we can talk about that these gravitational waves, we can talk about hearing the size and shape of the extra dimensions, which are the smaller, like, giving us this, uh, um, uh, different gravitational waves spectrum. So anyway, thank you very much for, for the opportunity. Yeah, so um, we are really grateful to give such an elaborative uh, review, uh, which basically covered the whole subject. And it's really nice that I'm, I am strongly believe that if I upload it, a lot of people will be benefited out of that. Okay. So it's, uh, okay, yeah, so thank you for your time. And yes. please unmute all, all the audiences and please give him give a clap for him <laughs> uh, now you can ask any question to the speaker but uh, i want to remind that since it the speaker already spoke <laughs> around two and a half hour <laughs> please don't ask too many questions but ask <laughs> yeah. yes i'm losing my voice actually <clears throat> Thank you, Professor Kuvedo. Uh, so, uh, uh, just uh, from uh, University del Valle del Guatemala. So, I work. Huh? I, I don't work on string, but I I, I work on little bit uh, supersymmetry phenomenology. But mm -hmm. when you discuss about the the modulinos, so do have uh, do they have any contribution in the superpotential of the Kähler potential modula and modulino together, and in some effect that they have some kind of uh, some combined effect in the perturbation or, or anything related yes <clears throat> yes well you saw the modulinos they <clears throat> uh, they they well they are they are uh, fermions so that they, they don't contribute to scalar potential of course uh, but they all get masses of the order of the gravitino mass so that is, that's a general thing you can just prove essentially so they have similar cosmology as the gravitino in that sense they are fermions and have a similar mass uh, we explore the possibility of, of having modulinos uh, stars, I say. So we have the, this in principle they can condense and, and, and create a, 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 a star like a, also gravitino stars or something. So we, we, we can estimate the radius and the mass and so on. But uh, yes, besides that, they have much uh, less implications phenomenologically being fermions, so you can just only talk about the couplings and so on. <laughs> Sure. Uh, uh, Swagat, you can ask the question, please. Uh, hi, Fernando. 
uh, I have a general question about uh, about this uh, uh, landscape and cosmological constant. Yes. So, so uh, in string theory, there are mechanisms by which you can satisfy all the criteria for uh, lambda to be a environmental variable or anthropic variable, for example. Mm -hmm. But observationally, you uh, you don't necessarily require only lambda to be uh, anthropic. Uh, even though, uh, even in uh, in Weinberg's paper, what you actually need is a combination of the scalar fluctuations, density mm -hmm. perturbations, as well as a cosmological constant. Absolutely. In the sense, you can have higher cosmological constant and higher density fluctuation. That universe will also have structure, right? Mm -hmm. yes. So, do we have a mechanism in string theory via which even the scalar fluctuation amplitude also varies as an anthropic variable? Yes, in principle, yes, because I mean, that depends on the shape of the potential and the shape of the potential is determined by the fluxes and so on. So eventually everything depends on the fluxes. So yes, so the answer is, is, is uh, yes. Even the step sizes, are the steps at which it, it should vary is also guaranteed, is it? Sorry, I didn't get that point. The, uh, for lambda, you need a step sizes which are smaller than, let's say, observed lambda. Yes. Uh, the yes. steps at which cosmological constant varies in string. Uh, for example, in Busso's model. Model. Yes. So uh, the same is also uh, guaranteed to be valid for uh, the scalar fluctuations, for sure. Yes, I think so. Yeah, that's, that's just as, just as you have to, to consider the, the most more complicated uh, picture, but I think the, the same argument goes through. Yes. Thank you. Yes, sure. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah. Uh, Yupo, please ask the question. Uh, yeah, so related to large volume scenario, uh, so when you're talking about the mass spectrum, there was an upper bound of 10 to minus 20 to electron volt. Um, could you explain how did you get that? Oh, uh, yes. No, that's, that's yes. Uh, <clears throat> no, that, that, that is uh, not upper bound. It says roughly that order that you can get uh, because you know that <clears throat> the, the volume can take a, a you can set in order to trust say perturbation theory or so uh, the volume has to be larger than 10 to the 3 but mm -hmm. smaller than 10 to the 9 in order mm -hmm. not to, in order to for for the for the model not to overclose the universe so in between mm -hmm. that range that, that that is and then you say well then the axion because partner of the volume will go a mass e to the minus volume to the two thirds mm -hmm. so, so you can plug this 10 volume to the two thirds but mm -hmm. there's, there's a coefficient in that, uh, eight, so that, that, that's, that gives you a rough uh, value because the coefficient can be a four to one or can be a four to ten. So, but it's essentially mm -hmm. it will the volume to the two thirds that give you how heavy this action can be. And then you I plug the numbers and you get uh, this very, very small quantity. Yeah. I see. Yeah, I was asking because uh, it is a basically the, the sweet spot which can be, you know, constrained from small scale observations and so on, right? So it can be, it's okay to lift up a little bit. You mean yes. like 10 to minus 21 or 10 to minus 20 is also fine? Yes, that, that, that's fine. Yes, yes. Okay, yes. thank you very much. Sure, yeah. That's, very, no, that's a good question, yeah. Nicole, you can ask. Uh, yes, um, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I have a question about uh, the tunneling the tool. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you repeat, please, uh, which is the problem when you try to do this uh, tunnel from, say, ADS to Minkowski or from ADS to DS? In oh, terms from, of traction. Uh, yes, from yes. Uh, well, there, there's an issue from from anything to DS from 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 anything to ADS. You can go depending on there's a, a condition depending on the on the on the on the tension of the brain and the difference of energy between the two uh, vacuum. Uh, from ADS up, I don't see anything. Uh, the, 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 as far as I know, it's not possible. Um, <clears throat> yes, but from DS to DS, that, that's okay. Going down or going up is okay. And the controversial part, or also from DS to Minkowski, that's not, that's not controversial. The controversial part is going from Minkowski to DS. That is, that is what, what uh, essentially Guth et al. proposed and Pochinsky et al. Uh, 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 confirmed, but it has been very much uh, criticized over the last 30 years. So that, that is the controversial part, I would say. Okay, and but uh, I was asking, trying to go from ADS to no, ADS, you, you cannot do anything. No, no. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, there is a, there is a, uh, well this this is a, uh, this this is stability. This instability is, is the Colman de Lucha. There's another surface instability which is called the bubble of nothing. 
<clears throat> and probably that, that, that may be what, what you, you may have in mind. So we then had uh, a paper in 1980s in which uh, a simple compactification to five dimensions, from five dimensions to four. <clears throat> he found a corresponding instant on similar to the Colman de Luce that will go from, uh, from the five dimensional uh, theory to, to, to a geometry in which uh, the space time starts disappearing uh, uh, at, at exponentially fast somehow. So this, the, and, and to something that, was, that is, it is it's called nothing, where there's no space and time. And so that is a source of potentials of, of another instability, different from the Coleman Delucci. And for that, it doesn't matter if you are in ADS or not. So it, the, the ADS can be unstable towards that, towards a bubble of nothing. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> uh, do you guys have any more questions? If not, then uh, please uh, clap again for giving such a nice talk. For I, I, have one. I have one. Can I ask one final question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, hey. Even, yeah. Even, if, even for you, I have one comment in the chat box as well. I have. I have seen it. I've seen it. Uh, I will reply later. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. So, uh, hi, Fernando. <laughs> oh, Alexander. Yes, that's the same. Um, yeah, no, I just wanted to know you, for this digital to digital tunneling for the Hamiltonian approach. You get you can get tunneling into. I mean, it's not published yet. I understand, but still, you can tunnel get tunneling to closed universes instead of open ones. Yes. And you also get flat, spatially flat. No. Mm -hmm. No. Well, we, that's the thing. We start. Essentially, the whole thing is, is the starting point. We, as as well as Coleman de Luce, start with the uh, with the spherical symmetry. Yeah. <laughs> and then see what happens next. And we don't do it, and nothing happens essentially for us. We start with the spherical symmetry and then up with the spherical symmetry. In doing that, you have to do some integrals, so the volume integral. Yeah. And if you have a spherical symmetry, the volume you can normalize to, to pi square or something, and then that's it. If you start with flat or open, those integrals give you infinite. So it may be possible that people can find some regularization way to handle those infinities, but at the moment we don't know. So essentially, doing with something that we can calculate, we only can do it for closed. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, I understand. I understand. It makes sense. Yeah. 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 Very good. Well, I'm I'm impressed that you listened <laughs> to me because uh, all those things are trivial for you. Well, trivial. I don't know. I mean, like, <laughs> you know, I don't. Know. What shall I say? There's this old saying by Newton, right? The ocean of what a given person doesn't know. Uh, the, the the amount of what a given person doesn't know is an ocean. <laughs> Very good. You just explore the few pebbles at the beach. Very good. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't think I know remotely enough to not listen to you. Okay, great. <laughs> this is a compliment. <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> yeah, no, I think this is uh, for the moment the only question which I have. But you're right. This is true. You start from from the zitter, of course. That has uh, you would need to start from a desitter with a different slicing already. Exactly. exactly. And then find a way of not having an infinite free volume on the on that slicing. Okay. So maybe if you started with something that has torus topology in, in, in three space. Yes, that could be a Then you could maybe do it. Absolutely. And I would like to know what the tunneling then is, so to speak, whether whether that gives a different rate. Yes, yes, that would be very interesting. That would be very interesting. Yeah. Because a big torus, I mean, I could be there, right? If it's ten times bigger than Hubble inverse now, we would have no no way whatsoever to know. Exactly, exactly. It will be still finite and so on. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Right. So they, they, they will rule out my 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 swamland conjecture. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway. You know, uh, you know me, I like killing swamland conjectures. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very nice. Okay, very good. Well, I'm losing my voice, I have to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go yeah. and go and uh, go and um, treat your voice with some nice cold water or some ice cream. Yeah, well, yes, I, I, I will treat it by listening to a seminar by Eva Silverstein that gives a seminar in half an hour from here. <laughs> Really? Where? On which on which side? You supposedly well, here in Cambridge, but uh, uh, but it's only for it's the, our cosmology seminar of the of the week. Ah, I see. Can you send me the link? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you but just that, post it on some public web page and then suddenly you have 10,000 people. <laughs> that, that, right, exactly. But, but, <laughs> it's a very interesting abstract, I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> I see, I see. So this is not, it's not about, about something published, is it about something unpublished? Like, yeah, yes, yes. It's very interesting. I need the link. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. Thanks a lot. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. okay so Have you guys ever looked, or has anybody ever looked at uh, two field oscillons? We have it in our list. I don't think uh, we have done that much. No. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm wondering because like uh, Francesco pointed us a few days ago to a paper from 2011 where people did that in the context of like conventional two field hybrid inflation. Right, yeah, but not in our. They, they did two field oscillons around the hybrid minimum, the, you know, the, the, the waterfall minimum. And they said they find oscillons and they are even much more long lived than, than single field oscillons. Right, there will be a lot of things interesting because naturally you can imagine just having at least the field with their corresponding axiom. That would be the, the yeah 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 for instance exactly Let's see see how you you how it goes yeah and I think and, and even thing. the hyperbolic field space might might play a role exactly yes no, I think that would be very interesting yeah <laughs> yes more sources of high frequency gravitational waves <clears throat> yeah 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 exactly exactly I'm wondering whether we in the end you know whether whether we end up in the end with something like Lyman Alpha Forest but for gravitational waves yes that would be wonderful. You know? <laughs> So many line or small small bandwidth signals that you need to basically use statistical tools yeah. <laughs> to kind of tease them apart. Yeah, Ho hope to be alive at that time. <laughs> eh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I think if I'm alive at that time, uh, I, how 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 does uh, Masayola quote say, say in in one of the saying Star Wars six? You know, when when nine hundred years old you are, you will not look as good as I am. <laughs> so if I am alive when, when, when these signals are found, such a random, nearly random forest of gravitational waves, I'll definitely not look as good. <laughs> very good, very good. Okay, so, well, I, I think we, can we, we finish or? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, well, so I have to go and treat my... my <clears throat> my throat somehow. It's a long yeah, throat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, bye bye. It was great to see you. Yeah, bye bye. Great to listen to you. Bye bye. Keep safe and healthy, all of you. And yeah, like uh, we we will meet again in the this week at the next talk by Professor Aninda Sinha on bootstrap. Hmm. Okay. Bye. Bye.